Okay, welcome everyone to the second afternoon of the Excel Jornadas de Economía de la Salud. Uh, today we are zooming in in Hola, the España, early life. Uh, perdona, pero esta sesión, la primera hora es en inglés. Um, so we are starting with a round table uh, in which uh, will be followed. Uh, this round table is going to be in English because our three speakers um, is a common language, and then the second <laughs> the second hour will be in Spanish. So um, we will have uh, after the round table one hour session with people presenting ongoing work. You also have um, nice pre recorded. Uh, um, presentations that I invite you all to watch. Unfortunately, we won't have time to discuss those online, but I'm sure that the uh, authors will be um, very happy if you share your comments with them. And if you missed the first session and also, well, you want to rewatch this session, um, it will be available, I think that later today on the YouTube channel of the Spanish uh, Health Economics um, Association. Uh, for those of you that were here um, in the first session and you and, and now you can see that the setting has changed um, a bit. So today you will be able to ask uh, questions in the in the chat and everyone will be able to see them and also uh, you will have the opportunity to ask uh, your own questions. So to keep a bit of a structure, I will um, ask you to either ask the question on the chat or raise your hand and then wait uh, to unmute yourself until I ask you, uh, well, you can ask your question. Um, to make sure that there is time for everyone, I mean, for our three speakers to go through their presentations, we will first go through the three presentations and have some time for discussion at the end. I hope that we have about 10 minutes. Uh, so after set all the organization, let me introduce um, the topic of the of the round table. Um, I have to say that as a chair of the scientific committee, um, well, I kind of ask myself to chair this session because this is a topic that um, I personally find uh, very important. I really care about it. Um, as in my opinion, uh, we as a society, we do not take seriously enough issues like children poverty, um, mental health problems in our kids, or differences in education. We look at our kids and we say, well, they are mostly uh, healthy and they are most of the time happy. So we give them um, less importance, but by now there is ample evidence that what happens in those early years of life um, has a strong effect on what happens in our future. Um, and this is really what this table is about. So for this, we have three experts um, and I will introduce them as before they talk, who have really worked in, in, in this area. So our first uh, speaker is Manuel Flores. He is from Universitat Internacional de Catalunya. Before working in Barcelona, Manuel was an economist in the Directorate for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs at the OECD. And he's been a visiting scholar at University of Wisconsin-Madison and Utrecht University. He has done quite some research himself showing uh, how important is early life conditions and future outcomes. And uh, as far as I know, he knows the literature pretty well. So um, he will be the first one to introduce us on, on this topic. So Manuel, the, the floor, the audience uh, is, is yours. Well, uh, Pilar, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me share my presentation. Can you see it? Okay. Are you able to see the slides? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I will be talking during 15 minutes on the long-term effects of adverse health and poverty during childhood. <clears throat> So this is a, a bit of the outline for today. I will start talking about the importance of childhood. And then because of the reasons that Pilar was referring to, then because we already know quite well that severe health shocks early in life have a permanent effects. I will today, I, I would like to highlight a bit uh, of a more recent literature that shows that also mild health shocks uh, might have uh, persistent effects. Uh, then I will move on to childhood poverty and illustrate one recent uh, study which shows that uh, childhood poverty has long lasting effects on education and earnings. I will then discuss a bit some of the mechanisms, especially for childhood poverty. So why 
or how uh, can childhood poverty affect, for instance, uh, education and earnings later in life. Uh, then I will focus a bit on Spain and discuss very briefly how our Spanish kids are doing in comparison with other developed countries. And uh, finally, I will speculate, and here I really want to underline that I'm speculating about how the current COVID-19 pandemic might impact our children and thereby their uh, long-term uh, outcomes. So <clears throat> the importance of childhood health. Uh, prenatal and early childhood events can have lifelong consequences. Uh, we know that pretty well. There was a review by Almond and Curry in the Handbook of Labor Economics. So almost any outcome that we typically care about, such as education, health, employment in, in adulthood, can be linked to a prenatal or a childhood event or, or circumstance. Uh, so this means that inequality in those dimensions, such as socioeconomic status and health, um, emerge actually very early in life. They have a, an early life origin. And Case, Paxson and Lubotsky in, in economics were among the first uh, to, to study this, this topic. Um, so early childhood and the prenatal period are in, in many ways a sensitive and even a critical period. So for instance, <clears throat> um, there is evidence that if a kid learns a second language um, before age 12, uh, it will speak it without an accent. So childhood is a sensitive period for learning a second language. And this can be extended to many other abilities and capabilities. Also, for instance, if a, if a baby is born with a cataract uh, and it, it's not removed within the first year of life, that baby will be blind. So. It, in this case, it's a critical period, right? Um, <clears throat> so this, so th this idea, th this fact that childhood and prenatal uh, periods are sensitive and critical periods for child development, offered us a unique opportunity for policy intervention in order to improve uh, later life outcomes among disadvantaged kids and uh, thereby reduce later life inequalities in outcomes such as health. And, uh, and socioeconomic status. And uh, I'm look forward for our two next panelists uh, who will cover this issue. And um, finally, um, it's, it's not just for equity reasons that childhood is important, but it's also for efficiency reasons. So the idea is that talent is equally distributed more or less in a society, but opportunity is not. And actually, some of the cost benefit analysis on uh, early life interventions show that the returns to these interventions are way higher than returns to other interventions that occur later in life. You can think of um, uh, secondary schooling or uh, programs targeted at, at unemployed people and so forth. So let me move on <clears throat> to, to childhood health. So as I was saying at the very beginning, we know pretty well that severe uh, health shocks uh, early in life have permanent effects. Uh, what we know less well, so there's a consensus on that. And actually there will be a presentation in the next session also exploring one of these famines. So this we know pretty well. Uh, today here, I want to highlight this more recent literature which shows that even mild negative health shocks at critical periods can seriously impair fatal and child uh, development. <clears throat> also because mild prenatal shocks are much more common than extreme ones like a famine. So within this literature, these mild shocks can be divided into several categories. These include, for instance, nutrition, stress, disease, pollution, Weather, shock, uh, weather shocks and alcohol and uh, tobacco. Uh, and many of these studies, which look at these mild shocks in the prenatal or period or very early in life, have found uh, that it has an impact on birth weight. In particular, it increases the incidence of low birth weight. And we know 
that low birth weight is associated with later life outcomes such as education, uh, health and employment. Uh, it has also an impact on test scores and it has also an impact on, on wages. So basically, this provides uh, evidence that <clears throat> these mild shocks at critical periods early in life can have an impact on, on childhood, on adolescence, and also in, in adulthood. Uh, often there is a considerable heterogeneity in the effect of a given shock. So for instance, uh, usually disadvantaged uh, households or disadvantaged kids in this case are more affected. Um, also, we might discuss later on um, why this happens. Um, is it because parents do not respond properly to a negative early life health shock? Uh, we know that in developed countries, parents try to compensate for a negative uh, early life health shock, while in less developed countries, sometimes uh, parents actually reinforce that negative biological early life shock. So we, we might come back to that uh, later on. So <clears throat> let me move on to childhood poverty. Um, we know that uh, kids uh, living Individuals who live in um, high poverty areas uh, do worse than those living in non-poverty um, districts in several outcomes, such as education, uh, health, uh, and employment. <clears throat> we know that. So this figure here um, illustrates um, the results from, from an experiment that was carried out in the United States in the mid-1990s, which was this moving to opportunity experiment. Basically, some um, low-income households were offered the opportunity to move to, um, to a, um, a non-poor neighborhood. And um, so Chetty, Hendren, and Katz, they used uh, tax data to study the impacts of, of this program on education and earnings. And, relatively in the 20s or so, when, when those kids were in the 20s. Uh, the main result is highlighted here in this figure. Basically, what they found is that those kids who moved early on, so to a better neighborhood, so basically when they were below age 13, uh, they experienced a positive effect in terms of their education and in terms of their earnings and uh, even in terms of uh, non-desired births for, uh, for, um, for girls who moved before age 13. Instead, uh, those kids who moved after age 13, in this case, between age 13 and 18, they did not experience those positive effects. So this is shown in the figure, uh, the, the kids that moved before age 13 are those with the blue line, and the red line corresponds to those moving after age uh, 13. So we, we see a positive effect in their earnings measured between ages 20, 28 for those who moved early on and a negative one even for those who moved later on. So again, this highlights uh, the fact that, first of all, um, neighborhoods uh, have a causal impact on, on individuals. Poor neighborhoods have a negative impact on individuals. And um, the timing here is very important. So moving early on is, is beneficial while moving later on might not help at all actually because of a disruption effect. Uh, so how do these effects of um, childhood poverty in this case um, operate on these later life outcomes. Um, so what we, we have some evidence that they operate both through um, non-cognitive and cognitive skills. So this is a figure that is taken from a paper uh, by Heckman uh, published in, it's already an old paper from 2006, but it's a classical one, I think. So basically it, it shows um, the figure plots uh, math test scores by age groups um, for, for individuals, for kids, uh, by um, quintiles of household income. So you have at, at the very top <clears throat> are kids from the richest, from the best quintile. And at the very bottom, you, you can see kids from 
the lowest income quintile. So basically what you see here is that much of the gap that we can see in this cognitive measure, which is a measure of uh, math ability between kids from the lowest and highest income quintile at age 12, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but anyway, uh, much of this is already there at uh, school entry age, so at age six. And actually, uh, rather than diminishing during the schooling years, it increases. So basically, this suggests that um, um, early life environments are major predictors of cognitive uh, outcomes. Uh, the same figures can be found for non-cognitive measures. So you, for non-cognitive measures, you, you can find exactly the same, uh, the same results. So again, this illustrates that early family environments in this case are more relevant than, uh, than schools actually for, uh, for predicting uh, cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes among kids. <clears throat> there is another recent literature um, which I find very interesting, which is also related to the figure that I was just showing. <clears throat> so basically, we know that poverty has been shown to have broad and enduring effects on child development. <clears throat> but again, the mechanisms are not very clear. So we don't know exactly how this happens. So we know it can happen through uh, differences in cognitive and non-cognitive uh, measures, but we don't know precisely why. So in three recent papers, um, these authors here, which are listed at the bottom of the slide, try to address this issue. So in a first, and they, what they use is, they use brain-based uh, measures. So in a first paper, which is not listed in this figure, they uh, study um, whether um, childhood socioeconomic status is associated with uh, a different brain structure among kids. And they do find that children from, um, from a lower socioeconomic status background have a lower uh, hippocampal, uh, a lower hippocampus. Basically, this is a brain region that is known to be affected by stress and it is associated with learning, memory and processing of contextual information. Then based on this finding in, in a second paper, and this is the one that I'm showing in this figure here, they uh, study whether, um, whether uh, brain growth uh, since month five or up to month 37, which is what you have on this slide, differs from for these kids from different backgrounds. And actually they, they do find that kids uh, from a lower socioeconomic background have uh, experienced um, less brain growth over this period. Then in a third paper, which I'm not showing here, they study whether these two findings explain differences in educational achievement between kids from lower and higher backgrounds. And what they do find, and this is a paper that was published in 2015, in JAMA Pediatrics, so it's a medical journal. Uh, they do, uh, what they find is that uh, differences in brain growth and uh, in brain structure do actually explain 20% um, of the differences in, in educational uh, achievement. So in this sense, uh, brain development mediates part of the negative association between childhood poverty and uh, education. So how, based on all these evidence, how do our kids in Spain uh, compare to other developed countries? So this is taken from the OECD child wellbeing data portal. And I want to underscore a few, a few measures, a few issues, which is where our kids are doing worse than those in other developed countries. <clears throat> and those are the, the square, uh, the red squares. So for instance, uh, Income poverty is a problem here in Spain. It's a bigger concern than in other countries. And I will show again, I will show another figure on this in the next slide. Um, also, I found it interesting and surprising <clears throat> that um, concerning parent-child relationships, there is a measure on whether adolescents 
talk to their parents before or after school. And uh, our kids in Spain are in the lowest tercile of this set of uh, OECD countries. Uh, the, the prevalence of low birth weight is also pretty bad in Spain, it's pretty high. And uh, childhood obesity is also higher than for the other, uh, than for most of the OEC, other OECD countries. Um, concerning childhood poverty, as I was saying, in Spain, this is the, it's the red line. Uh, the continuous one are for kids and uh, this continuous one are for the overall population. Childhood poverty in the EU is, uh, in Spain, it's among the highest ones, only after Greece, I think. And uh, that's one finding. And uh, another one is that uh, in Spain, childhood poverty is bigger than for the overall population. And this contrasts, for instance, very much with uh, Germany, which has very low levels of both childhood poverty and overall poverty, but also with countries such as Portugal. So how will childhood poverty in Spain affect uh, educational attainment, employment and health later in life? These are all very relevant policy questions that uh, we should be working on basically. And finally, to, to end my, my presentation, uh, let me speculate a bit about how the current COVID pandemic might impact our children. So <clears throat> early family um, environments and parental socioeconomic status have become uh, more important during the pandemic, basically due to school closings. Uh, parents themselves have been hit very differently by the current pandemic. So we know that um, for kids, I mean, it's important to have a desk, to have a stable internet connection and so forth. And uh, there are differences uh, in, in Spain, which are pretty relevant and higher than for, for other countries. Uh, we have also briefly reviewed the impact, the strong impact that um, early life environments have on future uh, outcomes. So will, will this increase inequalities in cognitive and non-cognitive abilities between our pandemic children? Yeah, I would say this is likely. What about their long, longer term outcomes such as lifetime earnings and health? Will they be affected? Well, this is something we will be studying, but a priori, I would guess so. And then before ending, um, we have some recent evidence in this case for England uh, that there has been an increase in the risk of mental health issues. So the problems of mental health have been increasing in, among kids, I'm talking, I'm referring to kids. And also over one fourth of, uh, of, of uh, English kids uh, report uh, disrupted uh, sleep. So they, they don't sleep enough. So concerning mental health, uh, there is quite some evidence that shows that uh, childhood mental health has a, a negative impact on, on employment, for instance, over the whole life course, actually, and that this impact is, is bigger compared to other uh, health problems, such as physical health problems or poor general health. So there's a paper by uh, Goodman, Joyce and uh, Smith that was published in CNAS in 2011. They show that using a siblings fixed effects approach they show that childhood mental health has a permanent income on employment of about a reduction of 10 percentage points, which is not at all negligible. In a recent work with Bobby Wolf, we, we reconstructed life course health histories, and we found that childhood mental health is linked to uh, an early onset of serious cardiovascular diseases. And then there is also quite some evidence of a causal effect of sleep on outcomes such as learning, cognitive development, health, and labor productivity. So again, sleeping is important and sleep problems have been increasing during, during the pandemic among kids. So uh, based on all this evidence, uh, what should we do? What type of policies should we, should we implement? Uh, I think the time for action is now and uh, I want to thank you for your attention and I look very much forward for the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, for the presentation. Uh, it's time for 
for action. Um, so <laughs> I think that that links us nicely to our second um, speaker, that uh, it's not that she's going to cover all the possible actions that we can do for our kids. Uh, Miriam Boost is the second speaker. She's an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen and the Center for Economic Behavior and Inequality. She's also with the Danish Center for Social Science Research and associate editor of uh, the Journal of Health Economics. Miriam has published several articles in really top economic journals in which she estimates um, the impact of early life interventions using, I would say, mainly the super rich and nice Danish administrative uh, data. Um, and I think that uh, today she's going to discuss some of the, the evidence that comes from her own research. So, uh, Miriam. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks so much for having me. I want to hide my video panel here. I can't hide my panel. Um, hide. Okay, I have a weird panel here. I'm sorry. I said I could handle Zoom, but I can't. So thanks so much for having me today. Um, and thanks uh, for the introductory talk that will actually already set the stage for my talk, which will be focusing on the question of early life policies, not shocks, but policies. And it will particularly zoom in on health policies and their short and long run impacts, because that is what I've mainly been doing research and I'm mainly doing research on now. So as we've already heard, um, early investment policies are an important topic, both in research, but I would also say in po for policymakers. So policymakers in many countries have actually embraced this kind of early intervention agenda. And for us as, as researchers, as applied researchers, I think it's important that we work for a, a base of credible evidence of what types of policies actually are effective in improving child outcomes in the short and longer run. So my talk will be research based in the sense that I will talk about some of my own work and I will very shortly um, talk about the rationale for early investment policies and this will also refer to Manuel's talk already. Um, I will present some results from research on the short and long run impact of specific policies that come from Denmark. And I think that also nicely highlight the challenges for empirical work that wants to establish what types of policies um, we should implement. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what I think what important alleys for research are to inform policymakers also in the future. So just to shortly summarize, um, why do we even care about early investment policies? So as Manuel already mentioned, across many disciplines, there is extensive research on the importance of early life circumstances. And originally, I would say people have focused a lot on dramatic shocks and have documented that these shocks that happen even while you're in the warm can impact your long run well-being and outcomes, economic outcomes that we care about. Um, in parallel to that, I would say in economics, there has been this um, theoretical work evolving um, that has given us a framework to think more about the production function that we have in mind and how we think about the production of child health and human capital. And Manuel has already highlighted some of the features. We now acknowledge that childhood is a multi-period uh, thing and we have both endowments in families, we have investments in various skills, non-cognitive cognitive skills. Um, we time those investments, whether they are public or private by parents, and they may interact in the production of, of health and human capital. And so from these models and the extensive evidence from across disciplines, I think the questions that we need to have to take to data uh, are the following. Are early investment policies actually effective? Are they efficient? And are they equality enhancing as some of um, the theoretical models suggest? So um, yeah, so that's what I said. So policies um, should be at the center of our interest because if big shocks and also smaller shocks to, to children, to their health, have an impact on their long-run outcomes, then we should think about policies to mediate those shocks or, or improve children's health. And so um, if you look at the economics literature uh, more broadly on early investment policies, then there's many different aspects that have been studied. Um, so income, family income and variation in income has been definitely at the center of interest. Near cash program, programs such as food stamps. Um, there's also a large literature on looking at how child care programs, early child care impacts um, children's longer run outcomes. And what I've been focusing on is this bulk down here, I would say, which is interested in, in policies that directly target the health of small children and their families. So there are many countries have many programs in place. And just to name a few, there's preventive care prior to birth and around birth, 
there's vaccination programs that we all care a lot about right now um, and should care about. And then there's uh, all sorts of kind of monitoring and, 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 and preventive care programs throughout infancy and childhood. Many countries have well baby visits or home visiting programs. And these programs have been at the center of my interest. I was re I'm really interested in understanding how they shape the short and long run outcomes of children. So the research on causal effects of these programs is really complicated by data issues and of course also endogeneity concerns. And I this, think this is important to highlight because even though we want to help policymakers, we want to help them draw the right conclusions. So uh, we really want to don't want to conclude from data on kind of length of hospitalization at birth at longer hospital stays, maybe even are worse for children's health because obviously it's not random who stays at the hospital for a longer time. And the same is true for other programs. And then Pilar mentioned that I come from Denmark. For many people who know Denmark, they think it's the land of milk and honey, but data issues when we think about early investment programs are really also prevalent in the Nordic countries. It appears to be, as Pilar said in the beginning, that we for a long time not really have realized how important the early childhood period is for the development of health and human capital. And this is also why we don't have so much data in this area, as I will illustrate a little bit later. So when we want to provide evidence on the effectiveness of early life health programs, we have different options to, 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 to bring along that kind of evidence. So there is some RCT evidence that I will not talk about today, but as you may imagine, it's not always feasible. It's, it's rarely feasible to randomize. Many of the programs that you may think about would be relevant in Spain or in Denmark. Um, predominantly, I would say the RCT evidence we have in this area comes from small scale very targeted high intensive model programs. Um, researchers in economics have gone different ways to come along with evidence on, on more kind of broadly accessible programs. And so two allies that have been chosen also in my own work is variation in access to programs. And here I will talk to you about a study of mine where I use the historical rollout of nurse home visiting in Denmark and kind of look at it as short run and long run effects. And then people are also starting and increasingly using variation in the design and central design uh, features of, of, of existing programs. You may think back to Manuel's graph of like when were you moved at age nine or at age 13. So there's variation within kind of implemented programs that was even not but still, I mean, you can see where this is going. So, so methodologically, this is where we want to go to actually learn more about the effects of these programs. So, but let me get to my own research, um, which is, primarily set in Denmark. And so there are maybe differences between Denmark and many other countries, but I would postulate that many developed program, many developed countries have a host of welfare policies and many of these OECD countries have a central aspect in them, which is universality. So there's accessibility, accessibility for, for all families to these programs. In Denmark, this is a specifically important factor. So the Danish welfare state has an encompassing set of different early life policies that date back um, to the 20th century. And, and so, so all of them are universally access, accessible. So that means they are directed at the general population. So I'll focus on the nurse home visiting program because I think it has interesting features also for today's programs. So this is just some pictures from the introduction of the program that I will talk to you about. So the nurse home visiting program is a program with a focus on information for new parents. It counsels new parents about the importance of health investments. It monitors the health of the infant. So as you can see here, the baby's weigh and the baby's checked for health issues. And it encourages um, investments such as breastfeeding still today or proper infant feeding. And another important feature of the program is that it's the first contact of the family with the healthcare system. So nurses also can refer families for further treatment to specialists or general practitioners. So the program was introduced locally in the 19, uh, the nationally introduced in the 1930s, 1937, but it was implemented uh, locally at the municipal level. And this is what I've been using in my research to actually identify the impact of this um, 10 visit program. Uh, because of the national co-financing of the program, um, we have variation in the, in the actual um, implementation of the program across municipalities that I just picked for you here. So this is a map of Denmark showing you for like darker colors um, mean an early implementation of the program. And if we had more time, we could discuss at length the identification and, and kind of the, the, the issues with that. But let me just uh, exploit that I don't have so much time and say we use that to actually show that the program in the short run was really effective in increasing infant survival or decreasing infant mortality. 
So this is just a graph to show for you the, the log infant survival in towns that implemented the program in a given year, so around T0 here. And you can see just from the means before and after um, in these towns that there, is a, that there seems to be an impact of the program implementation and access to actual care by nurses uh, on infant survival. We can go on and think about, this is in the short run, so infants uh, survive the first year, but what about the longer run? And here it comes handy that every Dane and every person who's living in Denmark has a registration of their place of birth. And by linking the place of birth, the treatment status of the municipality and the long run administrative register data, we can look into also health outcomes and human capital outcomes, labor market outcomes of these cohorts who have been treated in the 30s and 40s with nurse home visiting. And just a central graph from the paper on the long run outcomes is here showing that an event graph showing that uh, being treated with nurses kind of increases the probability of surviving beyond age 64, which is the longest age that we could look at um, individuals in that paper. In the paper, we also go on to study other health outcomes and find important impacts on cardiovascular disease, suggesting that early life nutrition that improved uh, also improved longer run outcomes, as also shown in work from other disciplines, not only. Um, however, as, as we also state in, in our paper, we don't see that this early life health investment impacted educational or labor market outcomes of the treated cohort. And this is also interesting to, um, to keep in mind. So from that work on kind of a historical program that has features that I still find relevant today, but was obviously implemented in a different context, we find that this early support of families, uh, the monitoring of health and referral to, to doctors, so it's a multi-component program, increased in the short run infant survival. It decreased mortality from relevant causes such as diarrhea, so it improved likely also morbidity outcomes that we cannot measure. And by improving that kind of early life environment, um, not only survival of infants, but also their health throughout the first year, it also impacted longer run health. And it did so in a very cost-effective way because it was actually a very cheap program. So I've already said is that even relevant for us today, I mean, the program is, um, is, is and we're looking at here is implemented at a period where in Denmark, the infant mortality rate was at 6.5%. Um, and there were no, not many other programs around, but I would still argue that the program had components that we still care about today. And we have in developed countries, many programs that care about these components. Um, importantly, I think that today's policy decisions do not really evolve around the access to a program versus no access to any program margin. So in the light of, of, of that, I think we have to move forward and think about what we know and what we can show about the impact of the design of specific investment policies. Because all countries, including Denmark, including Spain, do offer some support around um, the early phase of the family life. But we need to understand more how we um, optimally design these policies. And again, this is very challenging in a setting where a majority of families have access to these programs and we don't have really random allocation at hand. So how can we really create credible evidence that policymakers can use to, to actually develop new programs? So I want to talk to you about another study that I did um, in Denmark again, but looking at the contemporary nurse home visiting program. So it's the same program, it's still in place today. Today, people get an average of three to five visits and obviously the content has changed. We're not so much worried about talking about infant mortality uh, anymore, but, but still it has some of the same features by kind of counseling and monitoring um, and informing parents. Um, and what we wanted to study is how the timing of, of the program and early interventions in general impact infants, mothers and the family as a whole. And so what we do in a, in a recent project is that we exploit variation that was generated by a 2008 strike in Denmark, where nurses went on a two and a half month strike. And by exploiting that exogenous variation in missing a nurse visit at a given age for infants who were born just before the strike, um, we can look into the importance of whether you have an early or later nurse visit um, in your first year of life. And importantly, what we also can do in this um, paper, what Manuel also alluded to a little bit, is we can look into the mechanisms. So what is important about the program? Because obviously, design is also about like what should be in the program content-wise. So we, we try to look into informational components of the program and, and how important screening is for the results that we find. And just to show you some graphical evidence again, so this is a pic these are four pictures, this picking the impact of the nurse strike on the probability of of not um, having a nurse visit. And you can see, you can have an initial visit, 
And when you're born, so on the x-axis is the date of birth of the child relative to the beginning of the strike. And just look at the bold figure, which is the treatment year, the year up to the strike. And you can see that um, infants who were just born prior to the strike broke up, they have a higher probability of missing the first nurse visit, but the probability of missing the other nurse visits is really not changed because the strike only lasted for two and a half months. And you can see that hump-shaped uh, thing that moves through the period here. So infants who were born eight months before the strike, they have higher probability of missing the eight month visit. And so we exploit this exogenous variation because all the children were born, nobody could strategically um, time their birth and, and we have this treatment that hits these families rather unexpectedly actually. We use that to look into the health impacts in the short run of the strike. And what we find is some main results here that only infants who have been exposed to the strike early um, see a, a change in, in relevant health outcomes that we can measure. So we look into, for example, here, contact to the GP, and this is just for the family GP, but we do that also for out-of-office out of hours GP visits. And you can see that um, there's a persistent effect, uh, so a difference for the children born in the year prior to the strike relative to a control cohort. You can see that children born just prior to the strike broke out have in the short and longer run more GP visits, and we take this measure of healthcare take-up as a measure of health. Uh, with whatever that uh, entails. Another main finding is that uh, early strike exposure has a negative impact on maternal mental health in the longer run. We measure mothers up to four years after their birth. And we measure maternal mental health by looking into higher probability of, by, by showing that they have a higher probability of contacts to GPN specialists due to mental health issues. So again, it's a measure of healthcare take up, which is usually what we can use. And I think these results really uh, make us think about relevant mechanisms. So what about the program? So one thing that we can conclude from our results is that the early visits to the family are relatively more important than the later ones for the outcomes that we can study. Um, and we really think about what are the relevant mechanisms. And what we can show in our data is that nurses really focus on screening for mothers for maternal men mental health issues using the Edinburgh Depression Scale uh, very often. So, so that, that they do in the early visits and kind of foregoing that screening may actually impact um, the probability of mothers getting the right treatment at the right time. So, so we, we can show a little bit of that in the paper. And so another one that, another mechanism that we think is relevant is kind of this information and counseling aspect of, of the nurse visits. And we also may think that these, um, this channel is more important in the very early period. And as you see in the graphs here that are structured in the same way, so it's again kind of timing relative timing of the birth of the child relative to the outbreak of the strike, we can see that only the non-health educated, uh, the children of non-health educated um, parents drive our results with respect to um, the early strike exposure leading to more contacts with the healthcare system. And also when we look into first-time parents versus higher, higher parity parents, where we think the first-time parents are most likely less experienced, need more counseling, it's also kind of the early exposed, early strike exposed children um, who see effects here, and we don't see the similar kind of shape and patterns for higher parity um, children. So we think this is kind of suggestive evidence that both information and then screening play an important role. So I've talked about very specific research projects, but I think they have broader policy implications. First one um, is that the timing of early interventions matters for, for the health of infants and mothers. Um, and, and we, of course, need to think hard about other outcome dimensions that may be relevant. So maybe the eight month visit is really, really important for telling parents how to stimulate their infant and how to really um, uh, in, um, support the development of the child. So we need to do more research on that. And we need to factor in fathers, which we rarely ever do in this type of research and which I think is um, totally outdated and, and we need to be better than that. Uh, it's very often a data issue. Um, so our findings that information and screening are important for new families um, points to the importance of providing these um, aspects early uh, for new families in order to prevent later complications. And, and, and we think this may, one, may be one of the key features of making early investment uh, policies cost-effective. Um, and so, I mean, what I've showed you so, so far is that these programs um, impact the health and well-being of children in the short and longer run. But um, I think our research also has to factor in parents and, and their role in shaping um, their children's outcomes more actively. 
because it's important to remember that nurses may be mainly concerned with the infant, but they interact with the parent about the, um, the infant. Um, and so um, recent empirical work has, has really focused on this, on the importance of the interaction of public and parental investments and how we actually need to understand the impacts of policies by also factoring in how they modify parental behaviors. So do nurses inform parents about important investment decisions that they change in the following? Do they remind parents, for example, about a vaccine schedule? Or do they even convince parents who are hesitant about vaccinations to go and get that extra shot? So I think this is an alley uh, that is important for future research because as also the two initial talks here show, we tend sometimes to think about the two dimensions kind of separately. Um, we tend to think about, okay, there's the home environment and there's poverty in the household and then there's policies and we can kind of study the importance, but maybe it's really important to think about, or it's most likely it's very important to think about the interaction of both um, policies and the home environment and how parents react to policies. So let me just conclude uh, by saying that um, we have a theoretical work suggesting that early investments are really important and we have increasingly also empirical work showing that not only shocks, but also policies can have important long run, short and long run benefits for individuals and for children. And I think we need to think about not only health, but also other domains. And there is research that I've just not covered here looking into other domains um, that Manuel also covered. Uh, and I think there's still a lot to explore in the future for research in order to provide policy relevant knowledge, for example, on the interaction of different policies. Now I've just focused on nurse home visiting, but there's obviously a set of policies that children are exposed to throughout um, their early years and and most likely this plays a role because it's not only about kind of investing once but kind of keeping up the good work may be what actually drives the longer run benefits. Um, the targeted and universal dimension is really important and heavily discussed in Denmark and many other countries I'm sure in the light of remaining health inequalities. So giving access to everybody to a program does not really ensure that everybody gets the benefit out of it. Um, and so, as I, as I highlighted, different design features of existing policies are really important to study because we want to kind of think about how to optimize uh, policies in order to achieve the policy goals that they are set out for. Um, my own research will evolve a lot about the role of parents as responders, as first responders to policies. Um, and my, my big ambition is to both factor in mothers and fathers because I think it's um, the time now to think of the family and policies directed at the family in a more encompassing framework. So I think that was my 10, 15 minutes. I can't see you yeah. now, Ula. I may- Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Thanks, uh, Miriam. Um, I think that's, that brings us like that we need to look at other policies to now uh, focus in, in education. Um, our third speaker is Ana Cristina Dadio. Uh, she has worked as a senior policy analyst in the Global Education Mon Monitoring Report team at UNESCO since uh, 2017. Before that, she, was, uh, she worked at the OECD on a comprehensive list of issues ranging from financial education and literacy, inequality, poverty, uh, with a lot of emphasis on, on policies. So I think that she's in an excellent position to share her views about the effect of the COVID-19 on, on education inequalities across the globe. And I, I know that uh, we are a bit uh, late, but I think it should be fine if, um, I mean, just give, give your talk and... Uh... <laughs> I mean, we are. Thank uh, thanks a lot, Pila. I think, yes, we are a little bit behind the schedule. Um, first of all, thanks a lot uh, to all of you to have, for having me here. Um, uh, muchas gracias a todos y todas. Uh, but I will speak in English, so that will be great. I think that the stage has been set already by Manuel and by Miriam. And uh, differently from their presentation, I will be a little bit broader because um, I will look at really at the impact of uh, COVID and uh, how it is exacerbating education inequality uh, globally. We know and we heard that uh, poor nutrition, health condition and uh, learning in early years can result in uh, developmental delays and disabilities uh, while there are many programs inclusive early childhood care education that uh, gives uh, uh, much uh, better uh, chances throughout the lives and uh, 
and this has been uh, proven by many authors, by many scholars uh, since uh, the famous Ekman uh, papers. And then it has been really uh, integrated in a comprehensive, uh, in a comprehensive uh, framework by the uh, WHO in 2018 uh, with the nurturing uh, framework about um, built around uh, early childhood education and care and uh, the different articles that appear at the time on the Lancet. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, what the evidence tell us is that uh, those that should benefit most about early childhood education and care do not and in fact are at most uh, disadvantage and uh, risk to be left behind. And in fact, the early childhood education and care has been recognized as the foundation in life and has been uh, and managed and succeeded to make its way throughout the different C SDG in SDG 4, the Sustainable Development Goal for uh, about education. But uh, Let's, let's see this year what happens is that uh, we know very well that uh, uh, inequalities have fed the COVID-19 education crisis uh, during the period that we have all experienced uh, millions of people have uh, had to make very tough decisions. Individuals had to decide whether to respect or divide uh, quarantine restrictions. Medical staffs um, needed to choose among patients' competing needs, and authorities had to decide how to allocate economic support. And of course, the management of education also has posed moral dilemmas. And the disruption of learning confronted policymakers with really tough uh, decision and with the do not harm principle. So the requirement that no plan or program should be put in place if there is a risk of it actively harming anyone at all. Unfortunately, um, just as education policy maker look to the future to make an opportunity out of the crisis, it has become apparent that many of the solution uh, that uh, has tr have been tried have posed a risk for many. And the consequences of the health and financial crisis for inclusion in education were both immediate and are long term, as we heard also in um, the long-term consequence of not benefit of early childhood education and care are much more um, also present for not to benefit of education at all. In fact, we know that uh, many countries have tried with uh, uh, distance learning, but distance learning do not benefit at all because there are very different conditions uh, across countries and across countries. And we know that inequality has worsened, but it, uh, it is difficult to show how and by how much because data collection system have been challenged. Um, there are different sources of uh, evidence, each uh, uh, are casting light with different aspects on the crisis. Uh, and there are indirect assessments uh, of a current situation that can be drawn from existing and already collected uh, data set and uh, direct assessment of current situation that consists in administrative data, subjective views and phone surveys. And uh, in fact, what we see from this uh, different assessment is that there is huge disparities in access to internet concerning both the cost and the speed, um, both when we look at, into uh, technical characteristic of uh, the lines of the internet or the possibility of accessing internet in both high income and low income or upper middle income context. However, as you can see here in the chart, um, the probability of the poorest to be left behind, it's, it's really uh, very much bigger than those in uh, uh, the region's 20, or the income countries. And there is large disparities in access to computers and smartphones, and uh, also in uh, the low technology uh, devices like uh, radios and TVs, even in uh, very low income uh, context. I, for example, we have seen that radio ownership and the possibility of benefit of education programs by radio and TV is very, um, there are obstacles to it 
huge uh, because uh, in Ethiopia, for example, only 7% of the population uh, owns a radio and uh, in DRC is 8%, Madagascar 14%. And TV ownership is that seems for us something that is normal, it is not. And it is an obstacle to education. But even considering the, the access to a quiet room for studying is really something that not everyone uh, has. And uh, if, we, if we look at this data, uh, only less than one third of uh, 15 years old don't have one in Malaysia, the Philippines or Thailand. So these data come from already existing um, uh, surveys like, for example, the PISA data set that allows to collect some information about how access uh, has, uh, has been an unequal during this period. And there are also indirect access assessment concerning teacher, for example, looking at at the Thales data sets, uh, we know, for example, that in 11 countries, including Germany, the Republic of Korea and Uruguay, at most one in four grade eight students reported using ICTs weekly uh, to work online with other students, and one in three uh, used it to, to write or edit documents. And ed teachers reported that only five in 10 teachers had the technolo technological and pedagogical skills to integrate digital devices in instruction in the Netherlands and just three in 10 in Japan. There have been also uh, direct assessment using administrative data. Um, and one of these uh, is really the UNESCO UNICEF World Bank joint survey that has been developed this year, uh, uh, starting in March with uh, the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, which describes the overall situation, but also captures some support measures uh, for students and parents, for example, looking at uh, uh, the implementation of uh, subsidized internet, of subsidized devices, uh, or for teachers also. Uh, for example, which countries have uh, put in place these policies to recruit a new personnel when reopening was scheduled, or when whether countries and which countries have implemented um, ways uh, to uh, improve uh, the teaching content on remote uh, uh, learning. But responses are, inevitably general. There are also opinion surveys uh, um, run through, for example, the OECD or uh, the National Foundation of uh, Educational Research in the uh, United Kingdom. And uh, we can see that, for example, the OECD collected uh, uh, responses from in um, 59 countries and um, uh, try to gather a sense of uh, what uh, uh, student compared to what students uh, learn how effective was the strategy of education continuity and uh, you see you can see that many said impossible to say uh, learn it but not much and uh, um, or really there is uh, uh, the issue of learned as much as in school for a percent. So already from here we can see, we can get a sense of how difficult it is to assess what's going on during the COVID crisis. And we are talking here about uh, uh, generally level of education from the primary onwards that are in theory easier to measure. Um, there are also other services that have used to measure uh, that have substituted is normal household service that have been run by the World Bank or the Center for Global Development and Young Lives Project. But generally, uh, we have seen that uh, or uh, the responses or the, the, the the insights are general or very difficult to gather, but they give a sense of how the education inequalities uh, will be in the future. And it's very likely that will be um, widening. And also the financing responses are clear. Uh, we have listened about uh, early childhood education access, for instance. We have listened about early uh, policies concerning health and access. But very little has been said about affordability has been said about the quality of this program that is central, especially for level of education like early childhood education that is not compulsory in the traditional way of thinking. And the, the financing responses to the COVID in terms of education are very unclear. 
if you if you look at this uh, number that are on these slides, you can see that COVID response funding up to mid December up to add up to uh, US dollar uh, trillion twenty point four, but just. 0.09% of that went to education, which is really a huge issue. And the impact on budgets is really too early to say what will be, but there are serious concerns given the multiple uh, priorities and recessions. In addition, uh, target measures are lacking and um, only a few countries have been able to target the most disadvantaged. We have some examples on this slide, and especially in Latin America, uh, there has been a lot of uh, efforts put to, to reach out to the most disadvantaged people with disabilities or the most uh, poor, um, uh, with, uh, for example, a food program in school, uh, and also putting in, uh, implementing, or strengthening um, cash transfer programs to poorest families to ensure that the students add enough food. So we see here that there is um, there is really um, an important effort uh, throughout the world in um, increasing the integrated approach uh, to the COVID pandemic uh, in um, with the aim of uh, smoothing the, the effect on the poorest, but uh, we know that even if a financing response has not been clear, what is clear is that the COVID increases the urgency for investing in education. And this for the different reasons we have seen until now, that uh, there are disadvantaged families that are not targeted by the policies or not reached by the policies. Um, there are people that are disadvantaged and students with disadvantage that are at risk of dropping out. And especially we are talking about when we are looking at the early life policy, like early child life education, um, we see that many of these services are still very much provided by non-state actors. And non-state actors have been hardly hit by the, the COVID pandemic in the sense that um, Many have, uh, in addition to closure, generalized closure, uh, many have not the way to keep in on their activities, especially when you th we think about the context that are far from our mind because we are in Europe, we are in the global north, but the concern of people that are really fragile, like uh, refugees in displaced contexts, people that are ethnic minorities, like Roma students, like refugees, but also in European countries, where there is risk not to access um, quality services in early childhood education are even higher and higher uh, than we can imagine. So there is really an important uh, uh, issue to raise and address is the issue to assess equity in education and continue to work on these different uh, issues that have been highlighted by um, previous speakers. We work at uh, UNESCO in the Global Education Monitoring Report. We have a lot of resources, but I stop here because I think that uh, uh, at least we can have some minutes for a discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Anna, for keeping it, it short. Uh, I mean, I think that we cannot really go too much into the next session, but I think that I could still give the floor to one or two quick questions. Um, uh, you can just raise your hand or write them in the chat. Um, it's also fine if you write them in Spanish and then I can translate to our speakers. But I mean, if People are not are being uh, too concerned about the time or, or I don't know. I mean, I still want to ask you one question to each of you and maybe it's, it's going to be a very hard one because I think that you've shown plenty of, of evidence that uh, well, what happens early in life matters, that the policies are important and that we need to invest more in, in education and in other types of education. So um, would you kind of uh, be able to say if you had to choose what should be our priority, I mean, after we finish maybe the focus on all the vaccination and getting our population vaccinated, and then we have to choose one policy for um, one intervention for our kids to kind of 
close a bit uh, the gap of what has been happening. Uh, do you dare to do just one recommendation? Uh, who? Who, can, <laughs> who want to start? <laughs> so uh, if I can, um, I, uh, I would say that uh, really there is something that uh, is very important and uh, it's about uh, being more inclusive and really increase inclusion in education as a general recommendation to broaden the to broaden the, the understanding of inclusion in education because if the system would have been more prepared to include and to face and be confronted and address the diverse needs of the learners from the beginning, it would have been much better. If teacher would have been prepared to teach online, if the content would have been prepared in advance. So really it's uh, the, the concept of diversity is central to inclusion and making the system more inclusive really allows to re to, to address some of the problems that have been raised by the COVID pandemic. And in addition, really, Think broader. Th think broader. Think about uh, this. Uh, this different issue of education, health, poverty. I mean, I know uh, it's really a holistic approach that is needed to this uh, problematic, and not to see it like in silos. Oh, this is uh, education. Oh, this is health. People need to talk to each other and exchange practices. And I think this is really very important. The COVID pandemic gives uh, the possibility of analyzing the situation and uh, designing intervention with a new lenses. That's really what I think. Thanks, Anna. That's, uh, well, I think that's a really good recommendation. Miriam, Manuel? So I don't know if it's super relevant in, with respect to the COVID crisis, but so what I, my final point about kind of thinking more about how parents and policies interact, I think is also relevant here because in Denmark, we, uh, at least we, we talk a lot about how access is equal and, and in times like COVID, it shows that kind of beliefs, both knowledge, beliefs and, and, and other capacities of parents really play a big role when taking up care or offers from the public sector. And we need to be aware that we can just not say, you know, we have all these offers and then maybe uh, parents don't, are not all equally great at taking up the offers. So at least in the developed country context, I think this kind of focus on bringing in the interaction of policies and parents, changing parental beliefs about the importance of specific investments is, is crucial um, also in the post-corona time. Okay, thanks. Manuel? <laughs> Just to add something, because I, I agree with both with Anna and Miriam, I think I will put a bit more of emphasis on non-cognitive skills. So I think education systems tend to focus a lot on hard skills, but actually what we know from previous early life interventions that were carried out in the US, for instance, these very preschool programs and so, they did not manage to improve IQs, for instance, but apparently those kids, the treated ones, they did better uh, later in life and the interpretation here is that it improved their non-cognitive skills so I think these are very important for explaining many of our later life outcomes such as health education employment and so forth so I think uh, schooling systems should try to include those uh, those soft skills as well okay thanks uh, Manuel I think that uh, yeah looking at the clock I have to thank uh, our speakers for uh, accepting and uh, it's a pity that we cannot continue this discussion over a nice lunch or, or dinner in the physical conference I hope that you join the the real Spanish jornadas uh, in the future and now I'm gonna give the word to Joaquim who's going to um, yeah to chair the second session Joaquim sorry for taking 10 minutes of your session. <laughs> Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por la discusión anterior. Esta segunda parte de las jornadas, o esta segunda parte de la sesión de hoy la haremos en castellano. Eh, vamos un poco tarde, así que seré breve. Eh, la idea ahora es que tendremos a cuatro ponentes. Cada uno de ellos tendrá 15 minutos. El objetivo es que presenten su trabajo durante los primeros 10 o sí, así dejamos un poco de tiempo para la discusión y para preguntas. Igual que os hemos invitado a hacer en la sesión anterior. Intentaremos eh, escribir en el chat o levantar la mano cuando tengáis preguntas. Y ya sin más demora os dejo con la primera presentación, que será a cargo de Juan Antonio Quesada Torres, del Servicio Murciano de Salud y de la Universidad de Murcia.
con una presentación titulada Una estimación del ahorro para el sistema sanitario español de incrementar las tasas de lactancia materna. Y Juan, cuando quieras. Sí. Vale. Buenas tardes. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias a la Asociación de Economía de la Salud y a todos los participantes por darme esta oportunidad de presentaros el trabajo que hemos hecho, que es una publicación que realizamos en mayo del año pasado. Y bueno, sin más, como sé que vamos un poco justos de tiempo, os voy a compartir la presentación y eh, arrancamos. El título de la, de la presentación, del trabajo que hemos, que hemos realizado, es una estimación del ahorro para el Sistema Nacional de Salud de aumentar las tasas de lactancia materna en España. El índice o la estructura del trabajo que vamos a ver, eh, introducción breve, unos antecedentes para entender el contexto, material y método, resultado y conclusiones. Eh, por contextualizar o por poner en, en relación el, el, el trabajo que hemos hecho y la fundamentación del mismo, eh, nos gusta comenzar haciendo referencia a esta conclusión de una publicación del Banco Mundial del año 2017 de Walter Severwin y Sullivan, en la que apuntaban que la lactancia materna es una de las actividades de salud que mayor retorno genera en las intervenciones que se realiza, ya que cada dólar invertido en lactancia materna genera 35 dólares de beneficio económico. A partir de aquí, y para entender esta afirmación, hay que tener en cuenta lo que nos muestra o lo que eh, podemos encontrar en la evidencia y la publicación que tenemos hasta ahora. Los efectos positivos de la lactancia se extienden en términos de crecimiento económico, como ya incorporan eh, o calculan algunos países como Noruega dentro de sus estadísticas de crecimiento, de producción. Eh, tiene efectos positivos en la reducción de los costes de trabajo y de productividad por menores rotaciones, por ejemplo, y menor, y menor absentismo, reducción en los costes medioambientales, derivados de la producción de la leche artificial, un mejor eh, desarrollo cognitivo de los niños, menores tasas de mortalidad, tanto infantil como materna, y finalmente, uno de estos puntos serían los ahorros para los sistemas sanitarios derivados de la menor prevalencia de ciertas patologías en bebés y madres. Sobre este último punto, sobre el que nosotros hemos desarrollado nuestro trabajo, algunos de los antecedentes eh, interesantes, porque hemos seguido y hemos aplicado la metodología que otros autores vienen utilizando desde el año 97, en el que Drain para Australia hizo una estimación eh, del ahorro potencial que se podía alcanzar y lo estimó en 9 millones de dólares, variando las tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva en un momento determinado si las lleváramos a unas tasas objetivo o gold standard. En general, el uso de estas tasas objetivo suele ser la recomendación de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y de las eh, el consenso científico que recomiendan al menos un 95% de lactancia materna exclusiva al alta hospitalaria y un 50% de lactancia materna exclusiva a los seis meses. Posteriormente, Weimer en 2001 estimó para Estados Unidos eh, un ahorro, un potencial ahorro de 3.600 millones de dólares, considerando diversas patologías como la otitis media, la gastroenteritis o la enterocolitis necrotizante. Este estudio fue posteriormente recalculado y actualizado por Bartirian en Reinhold en el año 2012. En ese mismo año, Renfrew para, para Reino Unido y, y con un informe publicado por UNICEF, Estimaba igualmente eh, el ahorro potencial eh, para este país si se incrementaran las tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva al 75% y en unidades neonatales y al 45% en, en, a los eh, cuatro meses. Y a similares conclusiones, conclusiones llegaron en el 2016 Rollins y eh, colaboradores eh, en un estudio en el que comparaban diversos países, entre ellos Reino Unido, Estados Unidos, Brasil y China. Las, las patologías eh, utilizadas, sobre las que volveremos ahora, eh, nos llevan a, a, esta, a, a, a definir digamos, nuestros cálculos eh, dentro de un umbral prudente, puesto que únicamente hemos considerado cuatro patologías eh, únicamente referidas a los beneficios sobre los bebés y eh, en un plazo corto, es decir, eh, aquellos beneficios que se presentan en una edad inferior a los dos años de los bebés, descartando, por tanto, tanto la mejora en términos de salud para madres, otras patologías de los bebés que podrían haberse incluido y no son únicamente las cuatro que vamos a analizar ahora y además una considera podríamos haber tenido en cuenta una consideración más a largo plazo de la mejora en la salud de los bebés fundamentalmente relacionada con el posterior desarrollo de patologías como la diabetes. 
Bueno, el objetivo básico del trabajo eh, era estimar el ahorro que supondría para el sistema sanitario español, incrementar las tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva actuales, tanto al alta como a los seis meses, hasta los eh, estándares que hemos comentado antes, del 95% al alta y del 50% a los seis meses. Como consecuencia de la menor incidencia en niños amamantados de estas cuatro patologías que comentábamos, otitis media, gastroenteritis, infección respiratoria y enterocolitis necrotizante. ¿Cómo hemos desarrollado nuestro trabajo? Eh, los datos que hemos utilizado son los datos de nacimientos en el año 2014 porque eh, nos condicion el condicionante básico era la disponibilidad del tercer punto que presentamos en esta diapositiva de los costes medios de atención hospitalaria eh, mediante los grupos relacionados de diagnóstico en el año 2014. Nos fuimos a la estadística del INE del año 2014 para ver el número de nacimientos y eh, utilizamos las tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva tanto al alta como a los seis meses, según dos estudios de este, de, del mismo año 2015 de Jiménez y Oribe, que las situaban en España el 85% y al 15% respectivamente. ¿Cómo lo hemos hecho? Bueno, por un eh, análisis, eh, según las, los niños nacidos, las tasas de lactancia materna y eh, la prevalencia de estas cuatro patologías analizadas, por comparación vimos cuántos bebés enfermarían con las tasas de lactancia materna actuales del 85% y el 15% y cuántos bebés hubieran enfermado en estas cuatro patologías si las tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva las hubiéramos llevado al 95% o al 50% según los estándares recomendados. Posteriormente, por diferencia, obtenemos los bebés que más que, hubieran, que han enfermado de más por tener estas tasas subóptimas de lactancia y aplicando los costes medios por grupo relacionado de diagnóstico, nos llevaría a una estimación del ahorro potencial que podría conseguirse elevando estas tasas de lactancia materna. Los resultados los presento de manera rápida en estas tablas que llevan toda la misma estructura. En la primera fila tendríamos los niños o la situación de partida según las tasas de lactancia materna en, eh, de, analizadas y reales para nuestro país. Y en la línea subrayada en, en azul tendríamos el número de niños que enfermarían eh, si hubiéramos alcanzado las tasas eh, estándar o las tasas recomendadas. La diferencia aparece en la última columna entre la situación inicial y la situación recomendada y nos llevaría a cuantificar de esta manera el ahorro en función del número de casos de la reducción en el número de casos de cada una de las patologías. Para la otitis media, por lo tanto, Encontramos un ahorro estimado de, de superior a los 97 millones y medio de euros al año. Para la gastroenteritis eh, el ahorro se estima en unos 49 millones 800 mil. En el caso de la, infección, de la infección respiratoria, igual si alcanzáramos unas tasas de lactancia materna exclusiva a los seis meses del 50%, el ahorro se estaría próximo a los 50 millones de euros al año. Y finalmente la, entero, entre la enterocolitis necrotizante, como se trata de una patología que aparece en bebés neonatos, la tasa de lactancia materna de referencia fue la tasa de lactancia materna exclusiva al alta. Varía por tanto la escala en, el, en, la, en la primera de las columnas, saldríamos de la tasa de lactancia materna al alta eh, actual o vigente en nuestro país, el 85%, y se la lleváramos al 95% por diferencia en el número de casos de enterocolitis necrotizante que nos encontraríamos, el ahorro rondaría los 500.000 euros aproximadamente al año. En esta tabla eh, lo que presentamos es un resumen eh, agregado de los ahorros en cada una de las cuatro patologías. Si consiguiéramos elevar las tasas de lactancia materna de las actuales a las eh, recomendadas, para la otitis media, la gastroenteritis, enterocolitis necrotizante e infección respiratoria, y llegaríamos a un ahorro total aproximado de 197 millones de euros al año. Bien, ¿qué conclusiones eh, obtenemos de nuestro trabajo? Eh, la ya comentada, de los, eh, la, existe un potencial de ahorro si eh, incrementamos las tasas de lactancia materna actuales hasta el 95% y el 50% al alta o a los seis meses respectivamente de 197 millones de euros al año. Esto supone según los niños eh, nacidos en el año 2014, por los datos eh, utilizados, un ahorro estimado de 460 euros por niño nacido y cada incremento porcentual de la tasa de lactancia materna exclusiva supondría un ahorro estimado de 5,6 millones de euros. Derivado de esto, 
eh, llegamos a estos tres eh, puntos finales. Eh, en primer lugar, resulta cuantitativamente significativo el coste soportado por los sistemas sanitarios por unas tasas de lactancia materna subóptimas. En segundo lugar, la evidencia muestra que resulta poco costoso en términos económicos implementar medidas que permitan incrementar las tasas de lactancia materna exclusivas. Y finalmente, las actuaciones de fomento, protección y apoyo a la lactancia materna resultan económicamente eficientes. Volviendo así a nuestra primera diapositiva y alineándonos con esa eh, conclusión que obtuvo el, el informe del Banco Mundial del, del año 2017 que comentamos al inicio de nuestra exposición. Bueno, pues... Espero haber cumplido el tiempo y no retrasar demasiado. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Juan. Eh, perfectamente eh, los 10 minutos. Eh, no sé si hay alguna pregunta en el chat o si alguien quiere activar el audio y preguntarla. Si no hay ninguna, te quería hacer yo una. Sí, no te importa. Eh, has estado hablando de estas intervenciones y mostráis en el trabajo como son claramente coste efectivas. Eh, quería preguntarte si podías dar algo más de detalle en qué consisten todas esas políticas que lo que busquen es aumentar las tasas de lactancia de Es decir, en términos prácticos, ¿en qué consisten estas políticas? Pues eh, es, esencialmente se apuntan a, a dos grandes grupos de acción. De un lado serían las medidas de conciliación, eh, garantizar eh, bajas maternales eh, retribuidas y de duración suficiente para que madres y padres puedan apoyar la lactancia materna de los hijos y en segundo lugar una, una pieza, un pilar fundamental en todo esto es la formación del personal sanitario. Se ha demostrado esencial eh, que el apoyo en el momento del nacimiento y el apoyo en el sistema sanitario, tanto en el medio hospitalario donde se produce el nacimiento como posteriormente en la atención primaria, resultan esenciales para garantizar la continuidad de, de la lactancia materna e incrementar esas tasas de lactancia que tenemos ahora. Habría otras muchas, pero bueno, tampoco quiero extenderme con un detalle eh, demasiado eh, metódico ¿no? de, o demasiado fino. Entonces yo a, os apunt a, apuntaría aquí de manera general a esas dos grandes líneas de acción. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Y, bien. Si no hay ninguna pregunta más, eh, damos paso ya a nuestro siguiente ponente, eh, que será Yolanda Pena Boquete, de I Economics, que es un centro asociado a la Universidad de Santiago de Compostela y que nos hablará de las consecuencias a largo plazo de la hambruna de 1930 en Kazajstán. Yolanda, cuando quieras. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias también a la asociación por la oportunidad de poder presentar este trabajo. Entiendo que ya se ven las slides, ¿verdad? Sí. Ok, perfecto. Eh, pues eso, espero ajustarme bien al tiempo porque no tenemos mucho tiempo. Este es un trabajo conjunto con Manuel Flores de la Universidad Internacional de Cataluña que ha presentado en la sesión anterior y que un poco también me ha facilitado el trabajo porque ya ha hablado de las consecuencias a, a largo plazo de shocks en, en, a edades tempranas. También está realizado con Aishan Samambayeva, que es también de I Economics y forma parte de, de un proyecto que, que tenemos de, más amplio del Ministerio de Ciencia de Kazajistán. Eh, la motivación es que, y el background de este proyecto es que actualmente, y como ya tam, también ha explicado y se ha hablado en la sesión anterior, se considera probado en la literatura que los eventos prenatales pueden tener consecuencias a, a largo plazo. Eh, los primeros estudios utilizaron catástrofes naturales, tipo hambrunas, pandemias, guerras, huracanes, como experimentos naturales para probar y extender esta, la hipótesis de orígenes fetales. Esta hipótesis establece que la desnutrición materna durante la mitad o la última parte del embarazo causa un crecimiento fetal inadecuado y, por lo tanto, a su vez una predisposición a ciertas enfermedades en la edad adulta. Pero además esto se ha, implica, se ha ampli, ampliado y se ha estudiado también otros impactos como el estrés o cho, eh, choques negativos graves, choques negativos durante el periodo eh, prenatal además de la desnutrición. Nosotros, como ya veremos, nos centraremos más en, en la parte eh, de una hambruna. Y lo que, como se ha extendido también, es no solo para analizar los efectos eh, de estos shocks en edad temprana 
sobre posibles enfermedades, sino sobre otras dimensiones en edad adulta diferentes de la salud, como podría ser la, la educación o, o la renta. Eh, y, y esto va a ser uno de, de, de los análisis que vamos a re, realizar. Entonces, lo que vamos a hacer en este estudio es eh, tratar de cuantificar los efectos eh, económicos a largo plazo sobre los sur, supervivientes de la hambruna en Kazajstán. Y este sería el primer, eh, el primer estudio que ha hecho esto. Esta hambruna que tuvo lugar entre 1900 y 1933, que aunque no se conoce tanto los efectos en Occidente, eh, realmente es una de las peores y provocó la muerte de más de un millón y medio de personas en estos años, que supuso eh, la pérdida de una cuarta parte de la población de este país. Entonces lo que vamos a analizar es los efectos de, de esta hambruna en dos dimensiones en edad adulta, en educación y riqueza. En este caso lo que voy a presentar va a ser simplemente educación, eh, 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 aún estamos trabajando en los resultados de, de riqueza. Es cierto que una de las dificultades es que en, en una hambruna que, que supuso una mortalidad tan fuerte puede tener eh, un sesgo de, de selección difícil de discernir. Es decir, que quien, quien hubieran perdido la vida en este caso serían los más vulnerables y la población eh, más pobre. Entonces supondría que en promedio los supervivientes serían más sanos. Consideramos que en este caso eh, quizás esta hipótesis eh, no está afectando mucho a nuestros resultados porque la causa de la hambruna, o sea, la, eh, que son dos, una fue las sequías, y otra fue la co colectivización que se produjo en esos años por parte de la Unión Soviética, que lo que supuso es que eh, en este país, que eran principalmente nómadas, tuvieran que pasar a ser sedentarios, lo cual no tenían eh, skills para esto. Entonces, no, y además, y antes de esto, lo que se produjo fue una confiscación a la gente más rica, con lo cual realmente no, no consideramos que pudiera tener efectos sobre eh, las personas más vulnerables. Eh, la estrategia que vamos a utilizar va a ser la, similar a la realizada por Chen y Zhou en 2007, que estudia los efectos a largo plazo de la hambruna de, del 56 al 61 en China. Yolanda, Yolanda ¿Sí? perdona que te interrumpa. ¿Estás sí. pasando las slides? Sí, ¿no lo estás viendo? No. Oh, Vale, pues muchas gracias. Por Estamos pensando, ¿esa si... es una introducción muy larga o...? No, 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 no. Uh, eh, espera un ¿Puedes dejar de compartir y compartir otra vez? Sí. Vamos a ver. Porque así las veis, ¿no? Así las vemos, sí. Vale. Vale, genial. Pues ya estaba con la formulita. Va, eh, <risa> lo intento otra vez eh, a, o lo dejo así sin ser pantalla. Yo lo dejaría así, se ve bien. Vale, para no arriesgar. Muchas gracias. <ríe> Muchas gracias a ti, porque realmente, sobre todo para los resultados, quedaría un poco raro eh, que os fuera cantando los números. Entonces, la estrategia empírica que, estamos, eh, que seguimos es la de Chen Yizhou, como acabo de decir. Eh, la cuestión de la causalidad, utilizamos variación exógena en la exposición a la hambruna entre los cortes de nacimiento y las regiones para construir un estimador de diferencias en diferencias, que sería esta la ecuación que, que estimaríamos. Eh, lo que hacemos es incluir eh, aquellos cortes eh, cinco años antes y cinco años después de la exposición a la hambruna, eh, asumiendo que son los cortes que no fueron afectados ni eh, durante el periodo fetal ni a edad temprana. Eh, las variables dependientes, como hemos dicho, sería educación e índice de riqueza por individuo y región. Para estimar la intensidad de la hambruna por región, lo que construimos es un índice de contracción de, de tamaño de corte, Court Size String Index, eh, a partir de los datos del censo de 1937. Eh, sabemos que, que estos censos pueden estar un poco sesgada. Eh, algunos estudios están midiendo esto sobre realmente la dimensión de la pérdida de población, 
pero esto supondría que estamos estimando un lower band. Eh, lo que hacemos es estimar la interacción con los efectos de corte para ver eh, cuáles son los efectos de, de la hambruna y utilizamos como variables de control sexo, si es rural urbano, realmente la damide rural y el tamaño de hogar. Para este ejercicio lo que usamos son los, los microdatos de Demographic Health Survey Program del 95 para Kazajstán. También existen datos del 99 pero los estudios indican que es mejor utilizar solo uno de los años y además el problema es que en el 95 perderíamos variabilidad de regiones y sería ya la gente incluso mucho más mayor con lo que perderíamos muchas de las observaciones. Entonces, estas serían unas, las figuras descriptivas de las variables dependientes. Estos serían por años de nacimiento, los eh, años de medios de educación eh, por año de nacimiento. Y como vemos en la figura, se ve claramente cómo en el, en el periodo de, de la hambruna, los, los niveles medios son más bajos que en el periodo anterior y en el periodo posterior. No vemos eh, una evidencia tan clara, aunque sí hay una caída importante en el periodo, sí que es una variable mucho más cíclica, la variable de, de riqueza. Este sería un índice que proporciona la propia base de datos eh, en, teniendo en cuenta el, eh, pues la, tanto la casa, eh, eh, los tejados, etcétera. O sea, es un índice indirecto de riqueza, por eso estamos trabajando en él. A continuación, antes de mostrar los resultados, eh, muestro cómo sería el, el Court Stringing Index y lo que hacemos eh, por distintas regiones, estas serían las regiones de Kazajstán, es eh, igual que lo, el, este índice lo que mostraría sería el porcentaje de población eh, perdida, o sea, dis que disminuye respecto a la población media eh, en, de los tres años antes y de los tres años después de la, eh, de la hambruna. Es decir, en periodo, en periodo sin estar afectado por la hambruna, ¿cuánto, referente a ese periodo, o sea, cuánto se ha perdido respecto al periodo que no ha sido afectado por la hambruna. Eh, en este caso, en el primer caso, cojo simplemente el año 33, que es uno de los años más afectados. En el segundo caso sería un cálculo similar, pero teniendo en cuenta que sabemos que la colectivización llegó a las regiones en distintos periodos, lo que hacemos es que la duración de la hambruna esté ajustado según lo que duró en cada una de las regiones y esta hacer la media de la hambruna respecto a la, a la parte no afectada eh, eh, asumiendo del, del 30 al 33, o sea, todas las regiones iguales. Como podemos ver, eh, los, los números eh, mostrarían que, por ejemplo, en el año 33, alguna región perdió incluso el 50% de la población respecto a la población que nacen en años precedentes, a la media de los tres años precedentes y tres años posteriores. Y que realmente las caídas con todos los índices son bastante espectaculares. Eh, Estos serían los resultados. Los resultados, eh, la variable dependiente, como he dicho antes, es educación. Calculamos el, es el logaritmo del nivel de educación en años. Aquí están las tres, las tres eh, variables que he mostrado antes del índice eh, del Street Court Index eh, para el total y para la población rural. Eh, usamos el total de población por región y solo la población rural, asumiendo que la población rural tiene menos movilidad y entonces serían, eh, estaríamos capturando mejor los efectos de la población que ha nacido allí. El problema es que perdemos mucha base, por eso hacemos, intentamos hacer, eh, calcular las dos, uh, de las dos formas, estimar las dos ecuaciones y ver la robustez de los resultados. En general, lo que vemos es que las variables de control funcionan bien y, 
eh, los signos son aquellos esperados, eh, el nivel de educación eh, aumenta por ser hombre, disminuye con el tamaño de hogar y, y disminuye eh, con la población rural. Eh, vemos un efecto consistente de la hambruna que en, en, sobre la educación de aquellos nacidos en el 31, eh, con todas las estimaciones, pierde la significatividad cuando es heterogénea y rural, pero como he dicho puede ser un problema también de, de, de un sample tan pequeño. Cabe decir que además este año corresponde con aquel en el que los escritos dicen que es cuando la colectivización afectó a todas las regiones en Kazajstán, entonces fue cuando empezó a empeorar la hambruna y en, en aquel momento. Y vemos que en, en media lo que tendríamos es que por un, una caída de un punto porcentual, una, un aumento en un punto porcentual del Stringing Index, del efecto sobre corte, disminuiría un 13% los años de educación entre un 13 y un 18, bueno, un 13, incluso un 27% los años de educación, lo cual es un efecto eh, fuerte y muy importante. Para, los, con, para concluir, diría que los resultados muestran que a pesar del sesgo de supervivencia, que puede ser importante, la hambruna de Kazajstán entre el 30 y el 33 tuvo un gran impacto en la educación de los supervivientes que fueron expuestos durante la primera infancia. Mejorar la nutrición en la primera infancia puede conducir a aumentos sustanciales de capital humano, lo que sugiere que las inversiones en nutrición en la primera infancia pueden ser motores a largo plazo del crecimiento económico. Y simplemente algunas extensiones y en lo que estamos trabajando. Eh, estamos, como ya he dicho, lo que queremos explorar es los cambios a lo largo de la distribución, además, no solo en la media, y ver qué está pasando. Nos queda pendiente la riqueza, como, estamos, como he dicho, estamos trabajando con este índice. Eh, el problema de la base es que para... La población para los datos para la población de, eh, de este año, que es el 95, es decir, que estaríamos hablando de población de 60 años, no tenemos variables de, ni, de, eh, ni de mercado de trabajo ni de salud, con lo cual no podemos extender a, a otro tipo de, eh, de variables. Sí nos gustaría estudiar los efectos de segunda y tercera generación, que aún no ha, aún no ha sido muy, muy estudiado en la literatura, pero en modelos animales están teniendo, tienen un amplio estudio. Para reforzar lo, los resultados y, y ver y aumentar el, el, eh, la muestra, estamos pensando en ampliarlo a otros países de la región, de Asia Central, que también sufrieron la, la misma hambruna en un periodo similar, que es, por ejemplo, Kirguistán, un poco para ver si, eso, si la muestra más amplia nos ayuda, por ejemplo, con las estimaciones de riqueza, y un poco para tratar eh, el problema que, podemos tener de, que podríamos tener de mortalidad selectiva y de migración selectiva en nuestro análisis, como he dicho antes, Realmente no podemos identificar el lugar de, de nacimiento eh, de los individuos, por eso estamos intentando asumir la menor movilidad eh, de las zonas rurales, pero aunque tienen muy poquita muestra, estamos pensando en explorar los datos de Living Standards Measurement Survey, donde sí identificaríamos eh, el lugar de nacimiento. Entonces, un poco para ver si los resultados eh, se mantienen. Eh, esto es todo por el momento. Eh, estaríamos encantados de recibir eh, cualquier sugerencia o comentario. El, eh, los resultados aún son preliminares, con lo cual cualquier cosa que ayude a mejorar eh, sería interesante. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Yolanda. Muy interesante. Eh, vamos a ver si hay alguna pregunta.
si no, os quería preguntar yo, ¿tenéis información sobre la fecha de nacimiento, sobre el mes de nacimiento de los individuos? No, el año. Vale, ¿podéis explotar algo sobre si sufrieron el grueso de la hambruna en exposición in utero o si ya estaban vivos cuando pasó? ¿Para decir algo más sobre qué periodos importan más? Es que al no tener el mes sería muy complicado, ese es el problema. El problema es que la base está construida realmente para el análisis de, bueno, de salud infantil y maternal, pero claro, del 95. Entonces, los datos que tenemos para las personas que han, estado, eh, que han sufrido la hambruna serían aquellos datos que se dan para miembros de, del hogar, con lo cual son muy generales. Si es cierto que la base, esta, esta otra base eh, que vamos a intentar explotar, sí que tiene muchísimas más variables de salud y, y de detalles sobre el lugar de nacimiento y creo que incluso mes, el problema es que la he estado mirando y sé que el máximo de observaciones que tendremos va a ser 400. Con lo cual la cosa, cuando la empiece a limpiar, igual ya no sirve mucho. Todos. <risa> Genial. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, pues vamos a dar paso ya a Ana, que es de la Universidad de Zúrich, y que nos hablará de los costes laborales de los choques de salud en edad infantil. Ana, cuando quieras. Vale, aquí son las diapositivas. Eh, perfecto, pues voy a presentar este trabajo, que también es Work in Progress. En la motivación para este, este estudio es que muchas familias se encuentran en la situación de que uno de, los, de sus hijos sufre una hospitalización. Si miramos, por ejemplo, datos en Estados Unidos, en, hubo 30 admisiones por cada mil niños de entre 1 y 17 años en 2009. Y si miramos en Finlandia para una cohorte determinada, en 1990 el 36% de los niños sufrieron una hospitalización entre los 1 y 18 años. Entonces, esto puede ser una situación bastante estresante que puede generar un impacto negativo en el bienestar de la familia. Pero, pese a esto, no tenemos evidencia causal. Por lo tanto, este paper, el objetivo es estimar el impacto de un shock en la salud de los niños en los resultados laborales de los padres. Y para hacer esto, eh, utilizo una estrategia de identificación donde comparo padres que tienen la misma edad, es decir, que nacieron en los mismos años y que sus hijos también nacieron en los mismos años, pero que en, sufren la hospitalización a diferentes edades. Y con esto construyo un diff in diff y utilizando esta metodología encuentro que la hospitalización de un niño tiene un efecto sustancial en los ingresos de los padres, en particular para las madres, y para los padres encuentro que, el efecto, que no hay efecto o que el efecto es menor. También encuentro un impacto sustancial en la salud mental de los padres. Y en el paper eh, exploro y encuentro que el efecto viene de hospitalizaciones severas y que suponen una carga sustancial en términos de cuidados eh, para la familia. Con este paper eh, contribuyo a la literatura que ha estudiado los efectos de shocks en la salud, en los resultados laborales. Aquí tenemos estudios que han analizado cómo una hospitalización afecta tus propios resultados laborales, pero también tenemos estudios que han mirado efectos indirectos, entre ellos un estudio de Pilar, eh, donde miran el impacto de un shock de salud en la pareja, pero también tenemos algún estudio que mira el efecto de un shock en la salud de los padres, en los, en los en resultados laborales de los hijos. Eh, la literatura que ha mirado eh, la asociación entre la salud infantil y las decisiones laborales de los padres es menos mm, eh, causal, digamos. Hay algunos papers que han intentado controlar por observables, utilizando de panel, pero yo eh, básicamente avanzo esta literatura utilizando datos administrativos de alta calidad eh, combinado con una estrategia de identificación que me permite mirar shocks que están bien identificados en los datos y comparar familias que tienen características observables muy similares y que solo difieren en la edad a la que el hijo sufre la hospitalización. 
Bueno, para comentaros un poco más en detalle cómo hago esto, básicamente eh, si miramos eh, los shocks en la salud de los niños es poco probable que sean aleatorios y esto es lo que vemos en los datos. Si hago una regresión de diferentes mm, características de la madre y del niño en una variable mm, dicotómica de si el, el niño en esa familia ha sufrido una hospitalización, se puede ver cómo predice casi todas las características y entonces sufriendo que las comparaciones entre estas familias pueden dar variar, eh, resultados sesgados. Entonces lo que hago es concentrarme en una muestra de niños relativamente sanos que no han sufrido ninguna hospitalización hasta que tienen seis años. Y allí utilizo variación a la edad a la que el niño sufre la primera hospitalización. Y con esto eh, utilizo un diff in diff inspirado en los papers de Fadlon y Nielsen. Lo que hago es definir el grupo de tratamiento como niños que los padres son de las mismas cohortes y que fueron nacidos en los mismos años y sufren la hospitalización a una determinada edad, llamémosle TAU. Y el grupo control son niños que sufren la hospitalización en TAU plus delta. En, mi, en mis resultados principales, Utilizo delta igual a 4, entonces el grupo de control son niños que experimentan el, el mismo shock cuatro años después. Um, pero bueno, mis resultados son robustos a utilizar diferentes, diferentes eh, grupos de control. Y aquí el supuesto es que en ausencia de este shock, el grupo de tratamiento y de control hubiesen seguido trayectorias paralelas. Y básicamente, pues si miramos vemos que estas familias son mucho más parecidas, aunque no necesite que sean mmm, iguales en baseline características, sí que se ve que son mucho más parecidas. Solo predice eh, claramente el género, pero eh, introduzco esto como control en, en la regresión. Y ahora también os mostraré en los gráficos que no hay muestra de, de que estas familias siguiesen diferentes tendencias antes del shock. Y para hacer esto utilizo datos administrativos a nivel individual que me permiten liquear los diferentes miembros familiares, sus trayectorias de ingresos y de educación y las hospitalizaciones que sufren. Son datos de Finlandia y utilizo en particular el registro FOL que va desde el 88 al 2017. Y aquí tengo información del año de nacimiento, el nivel educativo, los ingresos anuales y la situación de empleo. Y también utilizo el registro hospitalario para los mismos años que tiene información de todas las hospitalizaciones y desde el 98 también todas las visitas especialistas. Y aquí tengo el código diagnóstico y la fecha exacta de la visita. Este es el primer bueno, el gráfico principal de, del paper. Aquí lo que os enseño es el coeficiente de la interacción entre las event time dummies. Estos son variables dummies para años relativos al año del shock, que sería cero, interaccionado con la variable trip, que es igual a uno para el grupo de tratamiento y cero para el grupo de control. Por lo tanto, estos coeficientes miden eh, la diferencia entre el grupo de tratamiento y de control para cada periodo relativo al periodo menos uno, que es el periodo excluido. Y como podemos ver, el grupo de tratamiento y de control siguen eh, tendencias bastante parecidas hasta que el niño sufre una hospitalización y allí vemos que los ingresos de las madres sufren una caída considerable. Eh, el impacto es de alrededor de un 3% de, de los ingresos que tenían en el periodo anterior al shock. Si miramos el, el gráfico para los padres, el resultado es menos claro, en particular para los primeros años no se ve ningún impacto y parece que tres años después sí que eh, disminuye también eh, sus ingresos, pero de todas formas el impacto es inferior al que observó en el caso de las madres. Eh, también utilizo los datos eh, de salud para mirar el impacto en la salud mental de las madres y de los padres y lo que veo es que para ambos los resultados sugieren que hay un incremento en el número de visitas con un problema de salud mental 
Eh, para las madres eh, parece que hay algún efecto en el periodo anterior del shock, pudiendo apuntar que el efecto en salud mental viene dado por la fecha en la que el niño se le diagnostica el problema, que podría ser anterior a la fecha de hospitalización. Entonces, para concluir, lo que encuentro es que eh, los shocks en salud de los niños tienen un impacto sustancial en los resultados laborales de los padres y en particular para las madres. También encuentro que tienen un impacto importante en la salud mental de ambos padres y creo que estos resultados son relevantes. Eh, en primer lugar, porque subrayan la importancia de asistir y apoyar a las familias cuyos hijos sufren problemas de salud, pero también implican que debemos darle una importancia eh, mayor a apoyar eh, en términos de salud mental a las familias que están pasando por estas situaciones. Y por otro lado, creo que este es un análisis útil que puede contribuir a mejorar cómo contabilizamos los impactos indirectos que se derivan de una enfermedad. Y hasta aquí mi presentación. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Ana. No sé si hay alguna pregunta. Tenemos tiempo a Pilar. Ahí está. Adelante, Pilar. Gracias, gracias Joaquín. Uh, Ana, muy interesante el, el trabajo. Eh, tenía una duda. Dados los datos que tenéis, ¿habéis podido mirar ¿Qué trayectorias sufren los niños? Así es el, el, bueno, al principio decías que eran las hospitalizaciones más severas, eh, pero ¿habéis podido mirar si empiezan a entrar en un ciclo en el que tienen hospitalizaciones muy continuadas o gastos sanitarios muy altos, peores resultados educativos? Sí, es una pregunta muy buena. La verdad que lo que he hecho es explotarlo más mmm, desde la heterogeneidad y lo que veo es que... Eh, si mido el número de visitas y hospitalizaciones que estos niños eh, hacen un año después de haber sufrido eh, la, la primera hospitalización, el efecto viene completamente eh, por las hospitalizaciones que después de este choque el niño tiene que ir de forma continuada al médico y, a, y, y al especialista y, a los, y, y sufre otras hospitalizaciones. Eso. Lo que hice es dividirlo por la media y se ve que si el shock es como una cosa que pasa una vez y ya está, no hay efecto, versus si es una cosa más continuada y persistente, es donde veo el efecto. Eh, no he mirado mucho qué pasa en términos de educación, sí que es algo que también podría como mirarlo, explotarlo más, es interesante. Gracias, Pilar. Gracias, Pilar. Hay tiempo para al menos una pregunta más. Veo que Grace ha levantado la mano, por favor. No sé si me escuchan. Hola. Sí. Hola. Sí, ¿qué tal? Este, bueno, me parece súper interesante la, la presentación y tenía básicamente dos comentarios. No, no sé si es que con, los, con la información que tengas en los datos los puedas mirar y me, parece, me, parece, me parecería interesante poder ver, aunque pueda parecer muy obvio, por qué motivos eh, el ingreso de las mujeres se ve más afectado. ¿no? A priori yo podría pensar que a lo mejor es porque las mujeres deciden dejar de trabajar para dedicarse al cuidado del, del hijo enfermo o porque reducen las horas que están trabajando, ¿no? Y segundo, si tienes información acerca del tipo de enfermedad que aqueja a los, a los niños, porque puede ser, estaba pensando que tal vez puedan ser, por ejemplo, una enfermedad más aguda, eh, tipo, no sé, un accidente de tránsito, algo totalmente desprevenido o, u, u otras condiciones que ya son de más largo plazo o crónicas como por ejemplo un cáncer o una, estos tipos de leucemias que pueden ser un poco más frecuentes en niños, eh, en niños ¿no? que es cuando tú empiezas, me parece que en, dices que es a los seis años cuando empiezas a ver los, los shocks. Entonces, eh, básicamente esos dos comentarios eh, es, son los que tengo. Gracias, Ana. A ti, del primer tema, eh, sí que veo que disminuye la probabilidad de trabajar, o sea que aparte de los ingresos también veo que tiene este impacto en el extensive margin de salirse del mercado laboral. También miré un poco si eh, había mayor probabilidad de que estas madres después se cambiasen de trabajo o se cambiasen a empresas que tienen más facilidades a nivel familiar como al sector público 
pero no encontré evidencia de eso. Eh, desafortunadamente en, lo, en esta base de datos no tengo horas trabajadas, pero mm, se, lo que sí que miré es que es condicional a seguir trabajando también veo un impacto. Que, bueno, esto es endógeno, pero apunta a que seguramente también hay una reducción en el intensive margin en términos de horas trabajadas. Después, en cuanto al más, ¿qué tipo de enfermedades están detrás del efecto? Eh, sí que intenté clasificar los diagnósticos de alguna manera que tuviese sentido para tener como eh, una clasificación de severidad y mm, no llegué a una conclusión de cómo hacerlo de forma objetiva y siguiendo alguna guideline, o sea que si alguien tiene sugerencias estaría genial. Hice esto que comentaba Pilar antes de dividirlo según... Eh, cuántas veces el niño tiene que ir luego al hospital y al médico para medir un poco la severidad. Y luego también en el paper lo que hice es comparar eh, el efecto de si el niño sufre un diagnóstico, bueno, una hospitalización por cáncer o una hospitalización por apendicitis. Y lo que encuentro es que, como se esperaría por apendicitis, tiene cero efectos en, en los ingresos de la madre versus el cáncer que tiene un efecto mayor de lo que veo en mis datos, en los resultados que he presentado hoy, en los ingresos de la madre. O sea que sí, me encantaría mirar un poco más con los códigos de diagnóstico que los tengo, a ver cuál sería la forma de mirar más a esto, a enfermedades crónicas y severas. Muchas gracias por las preguntas. Genial, gracias Ana, gracias también a la audiencia por las preguntas y comentarios. Y damos paso ahora ya a Irene Bosch, que es, presentará, es nuestra última ponente de hoy de la Universidad de San Jorge y presentará trabajo sobre el cuidado integral en diabetes. Irene, cuando quieras. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Se me oye bien? Sí. Vale. Disculpen que lleve mascarillas, que no estoy en casa y tengo que llevar porque estoy fuera de ella. A ver, vamos a, voy a compartir pantalla. No sé si se ve. Sí, te vemos la pantalla. Sí, a ver, voy a intentar poner como presentación, a ver si me deja. Se puede ver, vale. si algo se, se, ve se ve qué pasó, la está, está sí. saliendo el pase, sí. Vale. Bueno, pues, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias uh, a la Asociación de Economía de la Salud por dejarnos presentar este trabajo. Nuestro trabajo... Uh, está relacionado con el cuidado integral de la diabetes mellitus. Eh, como todos ustedes saben, la diabetes es una enfermedad no transmisible. Es una enfermedad uh, silenciosa que, por desgracia, a veces el paciente no es consciente que la tiene hasta que uh, aparece la neuropatía diabética, aparecen problemas visuales, etc. Y luego ya es demasiado tarde. Ya no se puede hacer un tratamiento pues, para echar para atrás la enfermedad, sino que ya es eh, pues amputar o lo que sea. ¿Qué pasa? Eh, si esta enfermedad pues aparece en edades tempranas, en este caso en niños o en adolescentes, que en este caso este trabajo va centrado en niños y adolescentes, si tienen una diabetes mellitus mal controlada, eh, tendremos un problema y es que crecerán y serán, cuando sean adultos, sean adultos enfermos, muy enfermos. Y eso implicará que el, sect el sector público y el sector privado sanitario tendrá que hacerse cargo de ellos. No solo será un sufrimiento para el paciente porque uh, las, las secuelas son muy graves, sino que es que además eh, el entorno social se verá mermado. Pues en este contexto de, de, de abordar la diabetes, eh, a veces pues, bueno, la gente se piensa que es tan fácil como pues, no tomar azúcar, es una dieta controlada. Pues sí, es verdad, eh, el estilo de vida es muy importante. Pero eh, es mucho más que esto, es mucho más que una... una una dieta equilibrada, y es que se tiene que tener un buen médico, un buen equipo de educación diabetológica, se tiene que tener medicamentos, se tiene que tener unos buenos sistemas hospitalarios, sanitarios, y la cosa está en que si se está en un país en que, bueno, pues que hay una asistencia sanitaria, entre comillas, gratuita, y, y el paciente puede acceder a ella, pues bien, puede acceder a los medicamentos, ya, ya los servicios de hospitalización o de ingreso de urgencias, porque vale destacar, que la diabetes es una enfermedad, que pueden haber hipoglucemias graves, hiperglucemias graves y que puedan requerir pues, bueno, pues hospitalizaciones, se puede entrar en coma, se puede morir una persona de, estas, um, de estos desajustes, pues eh, claro, pues tiene que tener un entorno uh, pues óptimo pues, para poder llevar a cabo 
eh, pues bueno, pues su, su tratamiento. Bueno, pues dicha esta introducción, eh, vamos a presentar este trabajo. Este trabajo ha sido realizado pues, por, por mi compañera Misericordia Carlos, de nuestra Rubén Virgili, por mi compañero Fernando Coca, de nuestra San Jorge, y por yo misma, que soy la que presento, que soy de Nebosch. Bien, ¿cuál es el objetivo de, de este trabajo? Pues este trabajo es analizar las necesidades de los niños y de los adolescentes con, uh, con diabetes mellitus, eh, basándonos en patrones, hospitalizaciones, eh, así como también de medicaciones y uh, de facturación, también ahora explicaré por qué digo la facturación de medicamentos, entre los años 2012-2019, uh, fíjense que es época antes de covid y uh, nos centraremos en Noruega, en un, país, en un país nórdico que es Noruega en este caso. Bueno, pues para poder llevar a cabo este trabajo se tiene que, pues, que realizar pues, pues, las bases de datos, se ha consultado a la Norwegian Prescription Database, al Statistics Central Bureau. Como metodología se ha utilizado el análisis por correspondencia y el software que se ha utilizado para tratar todos estos uh, datos ha sido el R, las librerías de, de R. Bueno, pues para centrar el trabajo y el estudio, uh, las bases de datos, eh, hemos empezado pues, para la clasificación al código ATC, que es la Anatomical Therapeutic Chemical Classification System. Concretamente nos hemos centrado en los medicamentos que son prescritos a, a los niños de estas edades. Recordemos que este trabajo está centrado para de niños de 0 a, a 9 años y, de, y adolescentes de 10 a 19. Es el código uh, A10A. Um, medicamentos usados para la diabetes y concretamente se han analizado todos los subgrupos de medicamentos A10AB, A10AC y A10AE. Quiero hacer un matiz aquí y es que para hacer y llevar a cabo estos tratamientos no son tratamientos como con pastillas, son tratamientos duros. Vale decir que el tratamiento de la diabetes mellitus es cuando es con insulina es pinchada y se requiere mucha disciplina y sobre todo hacer entre comillas resistente al dolor porque es un saco de agujas, se tiene que estar todo el rato pinchado también por bomba de insulina y luego o sea, son unos mecanismos muy duros. Bueno, pues ¿por qué digo todo esto? Pues porque cuando se han um, establecido estos análisis de medicamentos tomados, se, um, hemos cogido el a 10 b que son las insulinas de acción rápida, las fast acting, se han cogido los subgrupos que están aquí, que pueden ver ustedes, se ha cogido la, el código a 10 c que son acciones intermedias, insulina de acción intermedia, y el código AE, que son insulinas de acción prolongada. Dicho eso, una vez uh, analizados los patrones de medicamento que se han analizado, pues se ha estructurado la base de datos en base a la edad, que ya lo he comentado antes, eh, y los rangos, que también han sido comentados, y si era por hombre y mujer, niño o niña en este caso. Asimismo también, visto que los medicamentos, pues bueno, no deja de ser que, que llevan su respectiva facturación, pues se ha estudiado también la, la variable turnover by value. Como saben ustedes, en Noruega pues, uh, está, pues, el país está estructurado en condados. Pues aquí en el, en el estudio se han, se han estructurado pues, en condados y en health regions. O sea, los condados son los que ven ustedes aquí y las health regions, la estructuración del país tal cual está. O está la menor de Nornorga, Sorobos y Best. Bueno, pues uh, utilizando la metodología CEA se han estructurado por, por datos de prescripción, en este caso el A, B, A, C y A, e. eh, se han uh, utilizado aquí pues, las variables de los condados extraídos, así como los intervalos de, de edad. Eh, en este caso han sido los, las prescripciones los usuarios y los condados. En este caso, en la parte de arriba, pueden ver los resultados que se han analizado pues, con las prescripciones, usuarios, facturación y áreas geográficas. Y eso en cuanto a tema de medicación. Pero luego en cuanto a tema de servicios uh, hospitalarios, que como hemos dicho antes, uh, para llevar a cabo un buen abordaje de la diabetes, es muy importante que el paciente tenga unos servicios hospitalarios pues, que, estén a, que estén a su altura y que puedan atenderlo en caso de necesidad, pues bien sea por urgencias, bien sea eh, por hospitalizaciones, etcétera, etcétera. Pues la parte de abajo de la, de la pantalla pueden ver el análisis que se ha hecho con las health regions y eh, las, los servicios hospitalarios del país. ¿Resultados? Bueno, pues así resumiendo eh, rápidamente, pues bueno, ¿qué, ¿qué podemos ver? Pues el número de usuarios, 
y uh, las facturaciones del grupo de, de medicamentos, sí, el grupo ADSAB, recordemos que el ADSAB era la insulina de acción rápida, pues eh, son muy utilizados, es que es, es, su uso es notable. Eh, asimismo, que vemos que los, los medicamentos del grupo A10AC y A10AE pues, son muy usados especialmente en el colectivo adolescente. En cuanto al tema de los servicios sanitarios que hemos comentado antes, eh, vemos que en la zona norte eh, tenemos eh, la parte del North Zone, pues que la variable number of cases es, eh, bueno, pues es, un, es una variable que con menos peso tiene. En cambio, en, en los foros eh, tenemos los outpatients y los number of bed days, o sea, los pacientes externos y los números de hospitalizaciones de bed days, pues son notables. Ahí se nota más el efecto y que este colectivo de pacientes han necesitado más. Conclusión, eh, pues el tema de, de la CA pues ha sido interesante porque nos ha permitido con todos estos datos, estas bases de datos, hacer pues, los clusterings, poder haber eh, la interacción entre uh, los datos de prescripción médica, eh, las edades, las características del paciente y luego aparte también cuando se ha hecho el estudio geográfico en temas de la hospitalización, pues la, la clasificación. Entonces, muchas gracias por, por su tiempo. Espero que me haya acotado al tiempo establecido. Genial, Irene, muchas gracias. Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta. Y nada, si alguien la tiene, por favor, activad el micro y adelante. No sé si he dejado de compartir. Eh... No, todavía estamos viendo tu pantalla. Uh, voy a dejar de compartir. Ya está. ¿Hay alguna pregunta por parte de la audiencia? Pues si no hay ninguna pregunta más, creo que cerraremos la sesión aquí. Muchas gracias a todos y os dejamos ahora con el Speakers Corner con Miriam, que ha hablado en la primera sesión. Gracias. Um, Hello. Hola, simplemente para añadir un poco a lo que acaba de decir Joaquín, muchas gracias a todos por, por estar esta tarde con nosotros. Le pedimos a, a Miriam, voy a hacer una primera presentación en castellano y luego me cambia al inglés, que aprovechando que es editora asociada de Journal of Health Economics y que tiene una amplia experiencia publicando, eh, pudiese compartir un poco de tips and tricks para, para los, uh, quizás los más jóvenes o aquellos que con interés en, en publicar. Entonces, esta semana en vez de tener un Randomized Control Drink, uh, lo que vamos a tener es este pequeño Speakers Corner con Miriam. Uh, so, Miriam, I was introducing you and explaining a bit uh, the aim of this second, of this second part. Um, and as the idea is to make this a bit, uh, having a bit of an informal conversation, I would like to invite all of you to turn your cameras on. Um, so okay, then yeah. we, can, we can see who is here and, um, and break a bit, uh, yeah, maybe the more uh, formal uh, part. I think that Miriam, I don't know if you have like a couple of slides you mentioned or not. I mean, it's up I, to I you. Don't, uh, I, I have not uh, been uh, the best invited speaker today. I'm apologizing for not keeping the time. I have um, taken uh, too much time earlier. So maybe I can skip my like formal slides, um, however you want, if you just want to start talking with me or, I mean, if you want me to say something to begin with, I'm also happy to do that. So it's up to you. I think that's probably good if uh, to kind of break up the ice. Break the ice. Okay. So let me just you, share you kind of what, give, I, uh, yeah. what I prepared, um, which is just my humble thoughts on publishing in the JHE. Um, and I mean, maybe I even can say that I thought about this in more general terms, because I think it's also a more general question um, about how to publish the papers that you care about. And um, so, as Pilar, I think, said, I regularly referee uh, for the JHE, and they uh, have made me an associate editor, which basically means you referee more. <laughs> um, and so I, I do see my fair share of papers, but of course, they are all in my area of research. Um, and if sometimes there's something that I um, don't um, feel that I know anything about, then I also say no. Um, but, but usually, so I talk about this specific part of the JHE when I talk about projects. Um, so let me start by swapping to the next slide, if I can do that. 
Papers for the JHE obviously are supposed to be about health and about economics. Um, so, and that still leaves so much. And I mean, I think you should always, when you want to submit a paper, go to the journal homepage and read the scope and really ask yourself, does my paper fit? But I think the scope of the JHG is really relatively broad once you have these two aspects in them. And then people can start discussing what economics really is. But I mean, you should have some aspect of like health and economics in your paper. And then of course you think about the contribution of the paper and, and that kind of helps you to think about where to send it. Like, we tend to think about it as um, levels of like, how high do you aim? I mean, that's usually something that you ask people, how high should I go with it? And I tend to think about it, there's different types of contributions that you can make. And all of them are really um, relevant. Um, so you can extend and extend an existing line of research. So you can improve some existing knowledge um, by adding some additional analyses. Uh, I'm talking about empirical papers now because that is what I do. You can approach a known problem with a new strategy. I'm thinking about Pilar's recent JHE paper on, on cesarean section. It's a, it's a really known question and it's a, it's a very important question. And then you bring some new strategy to it and maybe also some new outcomes. You're, I mean, we even want to think about is that more than extending the line, but it doesn't, it's not supposed to sound negative. You extend the line of existing research. The second one is you can connect two dots. So you can actually argue that, okay, you combine knowledge from several areas. And then what we usually think about when we start a project is I'm going to draw a new line. I'm going to revolutionize what people think about this. Um, very often, I think this is not what the usual paper does. I mean, I'm humble enough to think that um, a lot of people have good ideas and coming up with this like very new thing is, is a big thing. And, um, but that is maybe what we perceive as the biggest contribution. I think as the JG as a top field journal um, has space um, for all of these. Um, and, but of course, the higher you can go, then that will impact your decision where to submit. Um, and then I thought about when people asked me about the JHE, then I thought about, okay, there's two sides for me of this process. One of them is being a frequent referee and the other one is thinking about submitting myself. So what do I look at when I, when I see papers uh, on, that are sent to me? Um, then I start with the first point from the other page, is that health and economics? Um, so do the topics and the concepts apply? Is there some theory or methodology, methodology or content that is important? And what is the contribution? So from the previous slide. Um, I also tend to look at, do I think that the paper is well placed in the literature? And that's particularly relevant if you want to argue that you um, provide some, some extend the line um, contribution, then you should also really make sure that your paper is well placed in the literature. Also because I think People who read the JHE, at least I talk for myself, uh, they are fairly specialized in, in health economics. So they also want to see that you have consulted kind of the relevant literature. And then I obviously I look at the quality and the credibility of the analysis because I only review kind of, yeah, empirical papers. And um, so a last point for me that goes throughout is the clarity of the arguments, the interpretations, um, the description of both the contributions and the limitations of the paper. I think these aspects you want to have in mind and usually what people, what I do is I look at the abstract, I look at the introduction, I flip through the paper before I kind of read it more carefully. So as, a, as an author, it's already important that you have made clear for me in the abstract that I should be interested in that paper. And the introduction kind of gives me a nice overview of the paper and, and convinces me that it's an important or interesting contribution. And then kind of do I already at first glance see that the paper is executed with care? Are the tables nicely formatted? I mean, that's just the basic of it, but like, does the like, actually present the, the evidence that I think I imagine you would come? I mean, you do that strategy A, do you present such and such evidence that would support it in your tables and figures? Um, I think at that, at that point, I rarely ever think is a paper too specialized or too broad, but it, it can happen. And then um, is it too narrowly focused on one country? That sometimes can also be an issue, even though I don't think it's a, it's a major concern. Um, sometimes papers get very, very specific about a very institutional setting. And then you want to argue why this is interesting for a more general um, audience. When I have a paper, and now I'm not talking about like, how do you make a great research project, but, but let's just assume you have a paper, you have a project done, you feel like you have presented it and you are done with writing it. Um, then I ask myself two main questions to start with. So do I have a time constraint? 
um, because I think when you have a couple of projects running, um, you want to diversify your risks, and that really depends on where you are in your career. Um, I, I think you have maybe one project you feel is your golden egg, so you really want to put it in, a, in the right basket. Um, now, not all journals take a long time. I don't think that JHE takes a long time. My own publishing experience and my own refereeing experience tells me that the JHG is a fairly um, fast journal. Um, but you should think about it. Um, and then it's important to tell yourself that you have only one shot, not only at the JHG, but every journal. So really make sure that you're ready. Um, so it's much for me about kind of clarity. You don't want to send it to the JHG to get referee reports back that tell you I wasn't really clear about such and such. Um, so describe your niche and occupy it. What is the main idea? Give me the big picture. Why should I care? So these questions I think are really important that you can answer them from reading your draft. And so for empirical papers like mine, I often think about what is the, what is the figure? What is the one thing that stands out? Um, and so this is much about like, how do you convince people from that kind of abstract introduction, the rest of the paper um, perspective? And how do you really know that, that you're there? I think you should never submit a paper that you have not given somebody else to read like in detail. And I don't know, so there's just this re reductance. I experience it that people are reluctant to, to give papers out to others, to colleagues to read. But I mean, comments from seminars and presentations, they, they shape the paper on the way. But before I submit, I have a colleague, a co-author, a, a person at the department if you want to submit general interest to somebody who doesn't know your field, but is an economist. I mean, so for the JHEs, give it to somebody who's doing JHE-like work and say, read my paper and, um, and tell me what you think. Um, so you want to really um, have it go through that person. I highlight that because um, I experience that quite often that people think, oh, I don't want to take other people's time and so demanding on people. But I mean, you can return the favor. We all need that favor. So that's a, it's, I know it's just another referee report. You don't need to make it a report. Um, and then incorporate the comments that you get. I mean, kill your darlings. If your co colleague tells you, introduction wasn't really clear for me or something, then change it. That is my five cents sense, um, for now. That was my thoughts. If you have questions, I'm happy to discuss or talk about them. Thanks, uh, Miriam. So uh, maybe you can, okay, now I see some, uh, it's nice that there are faces behind the screens. So uh, who wants to shoot first uh, or share experiences? Can I ask well, a question, Pilar? Yeah, please, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't raise my hand in the appropriate way, just the common way. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Marian. I would like to ask, because you just mentioned, um, make uh, colleagues to read your, your draft paper who makes a JHE-like work. So what is it, a Journal of Health Economics-like work? Because as you said, it's a very broad journal, but in my impression is that, um, well, it's very difficult to get a paper published. And I don't know, I, I may have my bias in my mind about what is the kind of, uh, JHE like work, and I would like to hear the, from you what do you think is the uh, kind of papers that do really get published? I mean, it's very easy to see what papers get published because you can mm -hmm. go to the JHE homepage and, and kind of see it. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. at, the, at the scope that is, that is described, and I don't want to talk for, as I said, it's, it is a journal that spans, but from my perspective, empirical work looking at the intersection of kind of Health and health economics with different topics covering that field fit. I mean, this is a weird answer, but I, I'm not prepared to say this is a paper for the JHE. Um, I think it's important when you write your project that you do your fair share of journal analysis. I mean, I don't think that you should bend over backwards to meet all the formatting requirements. And most journals who really are serious about stuff, in my opinion, do have your paper your way in the first place. So I don't think about formatting requirements in that sense. But if you go to the JHG homepage and you cannot find a paper that resembles what you are doing, uses a similar framework, uses a similar method, then I think it's a long shot. So I guess I would do it like that and, and ask um, people who have more publishing experience than yourself to read your paper and, and give you 
the impression. So it's, it's hard, I would say, to, to give some kind of general, this is a JHE paper. It's an um, innovative paper in health economics that has one of the three, at least kind of extending some existing research uh, agenda. Um, and I mean, so from the papers, I review them mainly in kind of early life health and um, health policies, uh, medical care for families, infants, mothers. Um, and I think they, are, they span broad in terms of context and settings. They come from many different countries. So it's not that the JG is biased towards the US. I would not at all say that. Um, I usually get papers that are very careful about describing how their papers do causal analyses. But I also get papers that highlight this is a descriptive um, paper and it has its merits because we don't really know anything about this question. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on, I, I cannot really tell you this is the JAG paper. I don't feel that I can, I can do that. Laura, maybe, I mean, so also to give examples of questions that others can ask. So do you have kind of a project in mind that you think, well, I don't know if that could be a research question that could fit the GHE. And then of course, then it's not only that the research question fits, it's also how you do the research question and how you sell it uh, from how I got it from uh, Miriam's presentation. So that, do you maybe have like a question that you think, well, we are working on that project and I have my doubts. Mm, well, probably not right now. Um, so I had it in the past, so I have my tries at HAC and I never <laughs> managed to get a paper published. I have tried. Um, I think, I mean, it's probably, um, well, it's, it's a very good journal and the identification strategy for any causal uh, type of a relationship paper that you want to publish is always, uh, you know, examined uh, to the details. And so in my case, I think in, in, in my experience, what, what I have found is that, well, basically you have to have a very strong uh, identification yeah. strategy for, for a paper. Agree. Yeah. I would agree on that, even though I have to say, I, yeah. So I think it, it's, that was my point about, is the strategy really convincing me kind of empirically? Um, when I referee and so so clarity and 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 these of the approach is is definitely important and in that mm -hmm. sense I, I agree with you. Um, I was actually reflecting about the history of my own JHE papers and so um, I don't know. So my my own JHE history is is starting with a paper that's very related to to Pilar's paper and looks at cesarean sections and was an RD paper and um, I would say extended an existing line of research that is still vivid and that has still uh, shot at the JHE definitely and that is still kind of open and, and interesting. Um, I would say three, three out of these four papers also ha had been at other journals. So sometimes um, that is helpful because you get really good comments. Um, from other journals and then you can actually improve. Um, all of these papers have in common that they use really high quality data, but they are not, um, no, it's actually true. They are all on administrative data. So good data is not a, is not a bad thing, you know that. So um, I try to find common denominators here. Um, yeah, so I think, um, and I think they are all extending existing lines of research, um, but I think it's always a question of like how you view it. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think you just have to unmute because I cannot see who wants to say anything. Uh, Manuel, I see you. Uh, it's your thumbs up or your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that a sign for a question, no? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to, to just raise my hand. Uh, so I think the question is a bit related. So sometimes I think when thinking of a research question, you can have this trade-off between having a very relevant with policy implication research questions, but maybe you don't have proper data or the, the um, 
the finest uh, identif identification strategy. And then on the other hand, you have a very good identification strategy, but not that relevant question. What waits more in the publication process? Yeah, I think that's a very relevant point. And it's something that is definitely almost a philosophical discussion we should have in our profession. Is this about chasing the next instrument or is it about making relevant research about a topic that you really care about? And there's always trade-offs. Um, earlier I talked about how I wanna look into parents' behaviors, how I wanna look more into mental health issues. The Danish data is not at all suitable for that uh, because it requires very often survey instruments. And so, so you're facing trade-offs and there's all as to what you can do. Um, so on, on, on some level, I think it's something that you also, um, persons feel different different about it but obviously your phd supervisor should never tell you go for this uh, project where there's no data and it's a great question but there's nothing you can do i mean then at least don't do an empirical paper um so i think you are right that you have to pass a bar of kind of credibility of um, the identification strategy in order to make it into the jag that may prevent you from going for um let us say, number of interesting questions, um, at least in a very empirical paper. But I mean, no paper scores like great on every dimension and um, every identification strategy has its challenges. So it's, it's hard to, it's a continuum and I, 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 it's not helpful what I'm saying, I, I realize that. <laughs> But I think it's also helpful okay. to say to say that, no, so that uh, people also see that it's not only their papers that have problems, but that all no, the papers no, do have problems. All. Yeah. So um, also, there's a fair share of luck of the draw um, when you come to your referees. Um, when you get some experience in refereeing and you see what other referees have been writing, then you will also realize that people really view these things differently. So I'm not saying you should always blame it on referee two. You should always read referee reports carefully because even though I read what other referees have been writing and I may not agree with everything, I think they tell you something about how you wrote your paper or what other aspects there could be or something. But it also shows you that referees, I mean, really look differently at, at what you're doing. Um, and so in that sense, the lack of the draw also plays a role. And usually, Personally, I'm usually not the causality police, I believe, but I, I, I do think that papers need to make clear what they can and cannot do. And then you may actually think, okay, is the question important enough? Or then the question arises, like, is that then a JHE publication? Thank you. Yeah. And the other Manuel. <laughs> Yeah, that you are, you are one next to each other in my screen, so that's funny. <laughs> Perfect, great. I had a very simple question. How important is it to write short papers? Because more and more often you see journals favoring short papers, lowering yeah. the word limit. And so I was then... just thinking about it before you asked because I thought that I should bring it up. So the, the one paper I have on, on the last polio epidemic is actually a rather short paper. And um, we also have written it as a short paper. Um, and so the JHE does both. And I think editors are happy about short papers and there's really a will to also do short papers, but I've never encountered, not as a as author or a referee that, um, that editors were super critical about um, lengthy paper at first submission. I mean, of course, like very lengthy papers, but I mean, there's no, to the best of my knowledge, there's no word limit in the first submission round. And then when you, move on to later rounds then sometimes editors tell you okay let's make it a little bit shorter or put like these two figures into the appendix but um it's not my impression so there's both at the jag but i think it opens some possibilities if people take it seriously because my my um polio related paper was also kind of rejected other places that we're actually asking for short papers, but then getting back to me with like tons of ideas of what I could do. It's like, can I do a short paper with all these things, you know? <laughs> so, but yeah, that's the, 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 I have to say, I've not really figured out the short papers. I tend, I try to read like 
the the short paper series now the inside and like all the other journals who do um short papers I, I really keep track of them to kind of figure out what these short papers are like what can be a short paper what is kind of important enough to make it to a short paper but you don't need to go into all the details i don't have a good answer yet thank you I have one question myself about data, um, because I mean, do you see that there is more a tendency to get like papers accepted, like from I mean, from your referee and uh, and probably you keep more an, an eye that use administrative data, or it's is it getting tougher to get a paper published that uses survey data? I mean, uh, I do see a lot of administrative data papers, and that's because I'm interested in kind of healthcare usage and and infant health and a lot of birth records. I mean, birth records are administrative data. You have them in many countries. So I I think there's an increasing share of, at least in my kind of experience as a referee, maybe because I've not seen them earlier, but from Southern America, South America. So there's a lot of new kind of admin data sets that are emerging. So it's not exclusively a Scandinavian thing. And obviously the US also has its fair share of admin data. So in the field that in the thematic field that I work in, I think there's a lot of admin data. Yes, um, there is. But that may well be related to the, the topic. more questions more i mean i know it's getting late we've been here for uh two and a half hours yeah so uh, but we only have medium here today so <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think that if there are no more questions uh i think that we can move on i don't know if ruth uh, mentioned that you wanted to say something about uh eyes and twitter and linkedin and i don't know if you, yeah. you want to take the opportunity <laughs> now or uh, <laughs> now finally ruth yeah it was my time good um so thank you, everyone. Uh, I think the whole session is going in English, so should I give yeah. an English word? Yeah, so I okay. would like to say thanks for having me. And because if you switch to Spanish, and I have some other family occasions going, sure, sure. So I will actually leave. So OK, but, thank you, Miriam, for uh, Thank you, uh, and good luck. Bye. OK, thank bye. you, Miriam. Bye. Uh, Ruth, ¿puedes cambiar? Sí, nada, os lo digo porque la, la mayoría son, son de, de España. No, solo mencionaros, desde la Junta habéis recibido un Noticias AES, eh, solo comentando novedades que tenemos en las redes sociales. Eh, una de las novedades es la consolidación de las cuentas de Twitter que tenemos en AES en una sola cuenta. Teníamos grupos de interés que cada uno tenía su propia cuenta y después la cuenta propia de la asociación y en un plan de reestructuración de, la, de las redes sociales. Eh, todos vamos a publicar bajo la misma cuenta, que es la cuenta principal de AES, que ha cambiado de nombre. No tenéis que hacer nada, simplemente vais a ver que, que AES Secretaría ahora se llama AES con Salud y que todos vamos a publicar en esa cuenta y los, los grupos van a tener sus propios hashtags. Entonces no vais a perder el contenido de los grupos sino que van a publicar con sus hashtags y tenéis, podéis seguir el hashtag, o sea, que podréis continuar eh, siguiendo Evaluáis, eh, que es un grupo muy activo, pero han accedido a, a publicar todos bajo, bajo este único canal que hace, tiene sentido a nivel organizativo y bueno, vamos a unar esfuerzos para gestionar es, eh, con AES y a ESEC, que ahora no, que no tenía canal, ahora va a poder publicar bajo nuestra, la, la cuenta unificada. Y comentaros que tenemos un canal nuevo en página LinkedIn. Eh, si estáis allí, nos podéis seguir y también podéis introducir que sois miembros de la asociación de AES. Y para acabar, eh, que tenemos un canal nuevo de YouTube también y donde vamos a subir todas las sesiones que, que se están grabando de, de estas jornadas online y otras jornadas que hagamos o sesiones se van a, se van a ver en, en YouTube y también nos, as, nos animamos a, a seguirlos. Los links están en, en el Noticias AES de, que os habrá llegado. Si sois todos socios, os llegará el Noticias AES. Eh, mirar el junk folder también, por si acaso. Y, y los que no seáis, bueno, pues haremos otras estrategias para que quede bastante claro la, la nueva estructura. 
era simplemente eso, desde la Junta de, de AES. Gracias. Gracias Ruth, al final, al final ha podido, para variar vamos, hemos ido un poco más de tiempo, aunque al final lo hemos recortado, no lo, la, fuimos mal la primera, fuimos mal la segunda, a ver si a la tercera va la vencida. Muchas gracias por quedaros todos hasta aquí y espero veros a, a todos y a todas en la tercera mesa de las jornadas eh, XR de Transición de Economía de la Salud. Hasta finales de marzo. Adiós. 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 Adiós.